This full build video has been brought to you by Squarespace. Today is a special day. For petrol heads, this is like Christmas and birthdays combined. It's new car day. So the Aston Martin is now done and sold. Bye bye, have a great time. And the TT is more or less finished, so we need something new to build on the channel. So I would like to welcome you to the new project, the Jaguar F-Type SVR. So I'm not normally a Jaguar kind of man, but this one really tickled my fancy for quite a few reasons. So the F-Type came in a few variants, originally a V6 and then the VAR, and also now they do a four cylinder, but this one is the big daddy, the SVR. So the F-Type normally is a rear wheel drive, two seat, a sports car, but this particular model is actually four wheel drive, but it needs it because it's packing a bit of a punch underneath the bonnet. Long side bro. Oh yeah. That way. Not only does the bonnet open the wrong way, which I only just found out, but in this car we have a 5 litre supercharged V8 with 575 horsepower. That's a bit of an upgrade from the Aston. That's such an ugly engine. That's not what matters, because we don't look at the engine while you're driving. You don't look at the fireplace while you're poking the fire. So there is a few things which make the SVR a cooler car than the standard F-Type. So we'll run through those things and then we'll go through the elephant in the room a bit later. So the first thing that you get is a nice carbon spoiler, which is pretty nice and also comes up and down like Active Aero DRS style, which is pretty cool. You also get one, two, three, four exhausts, which unfortunately do not pass the fist test, which is a little bit disappointing. You also get a bit more carbon around the car. You get carbon wing mirrors. You get a bonnet, which only comes on the SVR model with these very nice carbon grills in, which are quite sexy. I can't lie, I do like those. But the main thing for me which sold this car is the interior. So the interior is the main thing which sold this car to me. There's quite a few things in here which make it really, really special. The first thing being these seats. These only come in the SVR model. That's why it says SVR just here. And they have blue stitching, blue piping on this really nice shaped bucket seat, which let's face it, look the dog's danglies. The rest of the interior is all Alcantara trimmed with the same blue stitching and blue piping throughout, including on the door cards, which I just think makes this interior feel real different over the standard F-Type. But Jaguar build quality looks like it's showing through straight away because this is why I would not want to own one of these. Not just because of the glove box, but Jesus Christ, if the glove box won't close, I mean, that's just the start of it, mate. It doesn't work, I've tried to fix it. It doesn't work. Chris, it doesn't work. Right, okay. So the paint, I believe, is the same blue which comes on the Range Rover SVR. If it's not the same, it's very, very similar. And on the F-Type, it does look 10 out of 10. Now, I know it probably looks by now that I've got a thing for blue cars, given that the Aston was blue, the TT was blue, and this was blue, but it's not on purpose, it just happens by chance. Now, the wheels on this car I'm not sure I'm in love with them, but they are specific again to the SVR. As you can see, it's got a little logo just here, which says special vehicle racing. And behind that, you have some standard steel discs. There is an option on this car to have ceramic brakes, but obviously this car hasn't got that option. Now, just before we start up the Jag and take a proper listen to how that V8 sounds, I need to tell you quickly about Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one tool to help you build and run your own website. Whether you're looking to sell products online or just showcase your skills, Squarespace is here to help you do exactly that. And the great news is that it could not be easier for you to do. All you have to do is select one of their pre-made templates and then you can drag and drop images, text and even videos to personalise your website to you or your business. But don't worry if you haven't got photos to use on your website just yet because Squarespace has a gallery of professional quality images for you to pick from. But if that isn't enough for you, well don't worry because there is more too. Because they even have online tools to help you improve your website as well. So from online analytics, SEO and even e-commerce, they've got you covered. So what are you waiting for? Head to squarespace.com today and use discount code CHRISSLICKS and that's going to save you 10% off your first website or domain name. But for now, thank you Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Let's get back to looking over this Jag.
So the F-Types normally range from 20 to about 80 grand, but I got this one for a really good price, I think anyway, considering that it's the SVR model. But there is a very good reason why, and I'm sure we all know what it is. So what could cause damage to the car on the driver's side and on the passenger side that's gonna be like this? Has it hit another car or hit two cars, maybe gone down the middle of two cars? Because the middle actually looks, well, relatively okay. Now, we know there is a few bits that this car needs, and I'm sure there's gonna be more than what I think there is on the face of it, but let's go through what we know the car needs now. So first things first, we definitely need a front bumper. There's no amount of filler which could fix this. The splitter actually looks okay. That looks pretty salvageable to me. I don't know how this has survived, but this part has got wiped out. We also definitely need a headlight. We need a bonnet, which is gonna be hard to find because it's specific for the SVR model. We also need a center grill here because, well, that's ruined. Obviously this side of the bonnet is also wrecked and also the wing down here too, so they all need replacing. I'm not sure about the wheel at the moment. What do you think? Do you think this is savable? It's got quite a nice gouge out of it, but it, apart from that, it does look to be okay. So I'm sure there's a wheel refurb company out there that could fix that, but I don't know if I'd feel comfortable with it. And annoyingly, the diffuser has gone missing. I seem to have a habit with the cars that I buy, parts get stolen from the auction place because the Aston Martin had the badges nicked off it. And this one, I know that this hasn't just fell off because all of the parking sensors are all cable tied up and everything else looks intact. So whoever's out there and you've got my diffuser, I'm coming to find you. Now the rest of the rear bumper is actually okay, apart from a small scratch here. So it is gonna need paint, but is definitely salvageable. On the interior, again, most of it is okay, apart from the airbags. So we definitely need a steering wheel airbag for here, and also we're gonna need a dashboard. Now this part scares me because interiors are not my forte. I'm not looking forward to doing this job, but I'm sure it's all doable. So the car runs and sort of drives, but we have got a few warning lights on the dash and a few problems which need sorting too. So we have a tire pressure warning light, which is, well, that makes sense. We've got the airbag one, which makes sense. I'm not wearing a seatbelt at the moment, so that makes sense, but we have got a check engine light, and I'm not sure what's causing that at the moment. Hopefully nothing too serious. But we want to check what's wrong with the car properly, and the only way to do that is getting it up in the air and on a ramp. So let's get it inside and take a look underneath. I can tell you straight away, something does not feel right with the steering, and I don't think it's just a flat tire. So we start straight away by pulling the car into Nick's garage and getting it on the ramp to see if there is any damage underneath the car which we weren't expecting or are hoping not to find. So this could be the make or break part of this car. If there's anything serious underneath here that we didn't know about, I could be a lot of money down. So what we're looking for here is no substantial frame damage and hopefully no oil leaks from the engine or anything else that would be expensive. I'm sure there's quite a lot. Under tray is still on there. That's, that's a start. Ah. Okay. You guys know Nick. He helped me do the turbos on the BMW. Unfortunately. Yeah, he loves me a bit. Oh, Jesus. That's what the tires are. Yes, pump up. okay. So I said earlier that wheel might be savable. It's toast. A lot of grease on them as well. We are missing a drive shaft. First three-wheel drive. Yeah, <laughs> you've never seen a three-wheel drive f type before. Nick, I'm gonna blame you, you know, if this car is rubbish. Oh, here we go. Nick told me to buy it. He said, yeah, that would be a good car, that. <laughs> to me. To you. To me. There we go. So, I've got an under tray, though. Yeah. Yeah, it looks all right. Under tray's good. So this tie rod here has been welded by the salvage company which I bought the car off. I presume they've done that just to make it mobile again. I wasn't expecting that to be okay. Obviously we're missing the drive shaft. Got braided brake lines from factory, that's cool. Shock looks okay. Hub looks okay. Drive shaft look mint. Bluetooth drive shaft. <laughs> <laughs> this bit doesn't look too bad. Have you seen anything here, Nick? That ball joint's come out of the arm. Hurt the hub. Kind of thinking it might be worth replacing this corner. I would. Definitely. What do you think about the shock? Is it shocking? It's like your jokes. <laughs> <laughs> It's just a little bit mashed, isn't just it? Just that ball joint more yeah. than anything. And like these markings and obviously that weld yeah, there, yeah, yeah. but that's... We, we knew about you that. You knew about yeah. that, yeah, exactly. Can you see it there? Bust. What's that? Steering right there, clean, step, snaps. 
Oh my god. Well, that is exactly what we didn't want to see. That is a steering rack snapped in half. I'm blaming you for this. <laughs> you can't blame me for everything. That is not good. Well, I'm not going to be driving at home, let's put it that way. <laughs> you not say what you thought so far, in too deep. Um, I mean, it just depends how much the steering rack is, really. Um, I'm not too worried about this, that's okay. It's, I hate steering racks at the best of times. Steering racks and interior parts are my two pet peeves. And now this car has both. I've never seen a rack split like that though. I've never seen that in my life. Out of all of the one car I've repaired, I've never seen this <laughs> steering rack. It's all stainless though, or maybe even like you said, titanium. You, you see the colour of this bit? Yeah, yeah. It's that's what bluey yellow. I was looking in the wilds here, but got like a bluey colour there. Look at that. You got a magnet? Yeah, I'm gonna get you one. I wanna see if it's Titanium. <laughs> but apart from that, the steering rack is bad. The steering rack is bad news, I'm not gonna lie. I didn't want to hear that. But I suppose the good thing, because it's broken in half, it'll probably be easier to take out. So is that sticks. steel? Oh. So does that mean that it's I have- It's either very, very good stainless. Yeah. Or it's titanium. I'm gonna say it's titanium because that <laughs> sounds better. Because that doesn't look like good stainless. <laughs> All of that, none of that sticks. None of that. I'm, I'm like, saying it's titanium. That's a titanium exhaust. Okay, so the part number for this steering rack is JX53 3200DB. And the great news is there's none for sale on eBay. Absolutely none. Interestingly enough, though, it's a very similar part number to an Aston Martin DB11 steering rack. That sounds like a more expensive option to me. That one's two grand. <laughs> to be fair, could you not just take this brace off? Yeah, yeah, go that's that what I'm gonna yeah, do. Yeah, I've been what, looking, yeah. Take this X brace off. That's not as bad as I thought. Normally it's subframe off to get the steering rack out. I reckon it's probably one of the easiest racks. You reckon? Yeah. I reckon you'd even be able to do it. I think you're right. What do you think, Nikolai? I think you need to order some parts. I need to go shopping. Luckily, we're in Birmingham, which is the home of stolen parts, so... Jaguar Land Rover. Oh yeah, sorry, the home of Jaguar Land Rover. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully I can find something around him. A few moments later. Here we have a steering rack for a Jaguar F-Type two litre manual two wheel drive. So it's the wrong one. But I'm hoping we can try and make it work because there is no steering racks with exactly the same part number. Well, the part number itself is the same, but the two letters at the end are different, which is the variant. And whether that's an actual difference in the rack itself or just in the electric part, I'm hoping what we can do is use the electric part off the rack that's on the car with the mechanical part that's on this one and hopefully make one that works with the SVR. Fingers crossed. I told you, Birmingham always comes through for parts. It's just I bad. What is that about the knife? <laughs> they're, they're just all, Birmingham just has everything for everything. <laughs> it's literally like the mecca for car parts and they're all cheap for some reason. JX53 3200 B A on this one. On my car, it's D B. So I'm hoping that the difference isn't too much, and they kept the steering racks mechanically at least the same across all F types. That's my hopes. Steering rack is now secured, and we can start working on the car, or at least try and fit this steering rack, which may or may not work. But we felt at the first hurdle because the locking wheel nut key would not work for the locking wheel nut on the car. So we tried all sorts of locking wheel nut removal tools and then messing around with the locking wheel nut itself and even drilling into it, but none of these things actually seemed to work. So we opted just to leave the wheels on and try and take the steering rack without taking the wheels off. I 
I wanted to try and get this done before I get the car recovered home because at home I'm not going to have access to a ramp and it's going to be much trickier to do a job like this. But after a bit of teamwork, the rack came off surprisingly easily. This is much easier than on my BMW, for example, as you didn't really have to remove much to be able to get to it. And check that out. I've never seen a steering rack break like that. It's, well, it's a first for everything, I guess. To me, these two look exactly identical, apart from this one's broken and this one isn't. But this motor here is going to be calibrated for a 2-litre four-cylinder F-Type. And this one is going to be calibrated for the Big Daddy SVR. So I'm thinking fit this to this. And this was definitely all my idea. And then we're going to use the, that rack then and bolt that to the car and hopefully it all works. Is that my idea? All Chris's idea. See, all Chris's idea. I had it here first. <laughs> It all seemed to be going so well and spirits were so high so we popped the motor from the old one onto the new one and then went to fit it but spirits were not high for very long because very quickly we realised this was not going to work. There is minute differences between the racks. Hopefully this isn't a sign of things to come in the future on this build because this looks like it's going to be very tricky to find the right rack for this car. I was feeling so confident. Well, that's a sad sad situation for what was quite a positive video. It was going really well, wasn't it? It was, yeah. So then last two letters do mean a difference. So if you have an F-Type, don't buy a steering rack with the last two letters different. So some of you might think I'm a bit daft for trying to fit a steering rack with the wrong part number to the car, but there was some method of the madness because sometimes those letters at the end can just be like a year variant or something pretty small, but in this case, that isn't the case. But I think that steering rack really will be the make or break whether this car actually pays off because even though I've got a good price for it, the parts for the SVR can be quite expensive. So I don't want to pay the two and a half thousand pound for a new steering rack. But if you were wondering what I paid for the Jag, well, it was £27,500, which I don't think is too bad considering there's working examples of the same year and mileage roughly for about 70 grand. So if I can fix it for like 10 to 12 grand, I think I'm quids in. Now I have found a steering rack on eBay that has the same cast number as the one that's on the car, but a different part number. It's a GX rather than a JX, and it's a DC rather than a DB. Whether that one's going to fit and work, I do not know, but it's again a lot cheaper than buying a brand new one from Jag. Maybe if any of you in the comments section are Jag specialists and you can let me know, please do because I really need your help. And that leaves me exactly where I am. I've been scrolling through the internet for days, all through eBay, all through individual websites and I just can't find one there and I've even been calling around every single breaker in the UK trying to find this specific steering rack until finally after three days of looking I got this call. Hello? Chris, we've got one. So now we can finally go back to Birmingham where the car is and fit it to the car. But after days and days of searching, I have finally found a steering rack with a matching part number, even though it has come off a three litre F-Type, but with the same part number, we've got to hope that it's going to work. So the car goes back up on the ramp, and hopefully this time we're going to have a bit more success. Like I said in the last video, this is a super easy steering rack to remove. There's just four bolts that hold it on, which are really accessible, and obviously the tie rods and the steering rack knuckle. Once these were all loose, we then tried to take off the track rod ends from the hub, but we still had the same problem. Because we can't get the wheel off, because we can't get the locking wheel nut off, we had to try and do this without removing the wheel, which wasn't easy. <laughs> It's that Bluetooth drive shaft and ball joint that is. And with that attempt absolutely failing, we did exactly as we did before and just removed the inner tie rods from the rack, removed the rack and then we can deal with those track rod ends later. Then it was just popping out the electrical connectors onto the motor and then also just taking out the bolts the rest of the way and then the steering rack was free from the car for the second time over. So old steering rack is now off and not only is the part number the same, the JX53 3200 DB, it's got the same cast number and everything else seems to match up. So I think we're off to a good start, Mick. Yep, same. Exactly the same. Exactly the same. Jeez. You pull through with your three litre. I know, yeah, three litre rack. Nice. And it actually looks in better condition. Yeah, because it's not in half. It may be the case as well that this one needs programming to the car because we're not swapping the motor over, but I'm pretty confident this time it's going to work. In most scenarios, I'd be perfectly confident, but the amount of varying part numbers there are for steering racks on these cars is ridiculous, so I just had the feeling that the fact this was a 3-litre one, there was going to be something different about it. 
but luckily this time it did bolt up which is a good start whereas the last one didn't the next thing we have to check is if it's actually going to work on the car as i already said it took me days to find this rack and i actually managed to find it by ringing up a company called Eurojag, and they had one on the shelf that would match the part number for my old one and they only charged me 600 pound plus postage and packaging for it which in the grand scheme of things considering jaguar wanted 3000 pound for a new rack I don't think it's too bad. Right, steering rack is now on. The question is, is it going to work just from plugging it in or are we going to have to try and code it to the car or do some funny business? But there's only one way to find out. Okay, what we got? I mean, it seems to be working. I think that's okay. Nick! I can't see anything else that says it's not working. Well, I think your tracking's out though. <laughs> that's the least of my worries. Pointing that way, <laughs> Now obviously because we'd still got the old tie rods connected to the hubs we couldn't check whether the steering rack was actually working in terms of the power steering properly uh, because they weren't connected so we had to get these wheels off so I managed to call out a local locking wheel nut removal guy and he got it off in no time. So now I can finally take the wheel off the car and that gives me the space then to remove the old track rod ends from the car once I've removed the brake calipers first. The reason why we have to take the caliper off is the space from the track rod end bolt to the caliper is next to none so to get any proper access to it that's what we've got to do. So once those two bolts are removed the caliper is then free and we can hang that out of the way and then we can work together to get this track rod end out and put the new one in place. And then it was wheel back on and then to check if the rack was actually functioning with both wheels and turn the steering wheel in the right place, which thankfully it did. So there is the steering rack back on the car and I've got the wheels back on too. I've took off the front splitter just because we're going to have to get it trailered back to Leicester now. So that means I'm not going to scuff up the only bit of the car that's actually okay. So next clip, we'll be back home. And there we have it. The car is now back home and where we're going to be doing the majority of the work to it at least anyway. So... Hopefully we can get most of it done here. But we have a lot of work to do from here and it's pretty daunting, I can't lie. It's now back with me and it's solely down to me now to get all of this sorted out. So I think the first thing we need to do is establish exactly the parts that we need. One thing that I didn't realize when I bought this car is how rare it actually is because I believe only about 400 units came to the UK. And that's the reason why I want to be a bit more honest and transparent with you guys and share some of the realities of rebuilding a car like this. So this is going to be our new best friend for finding parts for this Jag. This is now the bonnet of impending financial doom. And because this bonnet is ruined, we can use this now as a whiteboard to keep track of all the parts that I'm going to need to rebuild the car. And it's not going to be easy because there's not loads of information on the internet about the SVR model and about the part numbers so I don't know say for example if the bumper off another model is going to fit so I'm going to have to strip the car apart make a note of the part number if it's on that part on here and then try my best to try and find it somewhere so the first thing that we're going to need is a new bonnet because this one is crumpled. Now luckily the vents are savable so I just need the bonnet itself and some of you mentioned in the last video that any bonnet off an all-wheel drive car will fit the car and these vents in the right place so all I need to do is make a note of the part number and go and find one of them. And that is the only stamping on the bonnet I can find. So I've made a note of that, but I think that is going to be the easiest part number to find. To find the rest, I'm going to have to start stripping it apart. And there's no more ideal place to start that process than at the front. So I officially start work on the Jag by removing the front bumper. And this was actually really easy because half of it was hanging off. So there was just a bunch of 10 mils on the top holding it in place. And then one in the passenger wheel arch liner. And I could get it off the car and then there was just a wiring loom to disconnect and we were good to go. And that's about the easiest front bumper I've ever removed, but I suppose it's only half a bumper though. Now this bumper has a front skin, which is the painted bit, and then the rear kind of reinforcement, which is this bit here, and I'm definitely going to need that because there's not much left, so let's make a note of this part number. Then we've got the grill on the driver's side, which I'm going to need, but I haven't obviously got that because it's, well, disintegrated, so I'm going to make a note of the part number off the passenger side and hope this comes as one piece. I think now you're starting to get the idea, so I'm gonna check back with you once I've got all of the part numbers that I need off the front bumper. So I think that is everything I need for the front bumper. There may well be the odd extra little bit, but we'll find that when we come to it, but that's kind of the majority 
that I need. That's quite a lot, really. I think what I've also learned about the part numbers is that anything that begins with HX is SVR specific, so they're gonna be the really difficult parts to find. Luckily, the only thing off the front bumper so far, which is HX, is the driver's side grille with the parking sensor in it. So that's, I can't imagine that being an arm and leg. You know, it can only be a few hundred pound tops, so that's not too bad. The SVR front bumper, I can't find a part number on the bumper, probably because the section with the part number on is completely obliterated, but uh, yeah, so that's definitely SVR specific as well but everything else is either EX, GX, or JX. So hopefully those bits are a little bit easier to find. Now the thing that makes this car slightly more challenging than just a normal F-Type SVR, if there's such a thing, is that this is a facelift one. So after 2018 until 2020, they did the facelift where they fitted these LED lights, which look quite a lot nicer to be fair, and a lot more modern. But that does mean that this production run of this car with this shape headlight was only two years. So there could be some small changes and things like that that I'm not aware of, which could make it even more of a nightmare is if this car wasn't hard enough already. So this I think is gonna need replacing too because there's not really much left to bolt it onto the car. So it's not even really repairable. So unfortunately this is now a spares or repairs light. So if there is anyone out there that does need one for spares and repairs, you know where to get at me. But uh, let's get the part number off this and then we can guess roughly what it's gonna be off the driver's side, off this part number, and we can add that to the list. If I'm being honest, it's a little bit scary how quick this list is growing because I've only just started scratching the surface. So this is the passenger side and this airbox support bracket is completely gone on the driver's side. So what I'm gonna have to do again is try and use this part number here to find the one for the opposite side. Now on the SVR only, there is a kind of two layer wing. The first layer is plastic and then the second layer is metal. And these are both again specific to the SVR. So I need the number for the outer wing and also the inner metal wing too. And with the fact that the plastic part is completely disintegrated, I have no reference point for the part number for the outer wing. Because the front part of the side skirt is completely gone, that makes taking off the inner part of the wing a breeze and it comes off with just a few bolts in the door shut and just a few bolts underneath the bonnet. Now it would be so much easier if I could find an F-Type SVR that had rear end damage that I could take all the parts from, but unfortunately that's just simply not the case with this car. So the list keeps on growing and I'm sure this is just going to be the start of it because there's going to be so many little bits that I'm going to need in order to complete this build and also probably some bits I forget. Now I'm not only going to just need the bonnet, I'm going to need new hinges as well, but I'm also going to need these. These kind of deploy when the airbags and everything go, when the car's been in a, a collision and make the bonnet kind of pop up. Uh, I think it's to protect pedestrians, um, but yeah, they're definitely going to need replacing. Because without them, I can't close the bonnet. So I've got kind of the first quick fill-in of all the parts that I'm going to need on the bonnet of impending financial doom. And there is quite a lot here. Considering that's just kind of a first go over the car after I've stripped it back quickly, I think this could get expensive. That's why it's so important that we've got to try and save as much as we can that's on the car that's okay, and also fix as much as we can without doing any dodgy repairs. And that's why I need to try and save all of the areas of the car where the paint works all right, and you know we can try and avoid having these areas repaired because the costs can mass up so quickly on this car. Now this I spotted, which I don't really want to replace this whole mirror cap just for a slight scuff here, so I'm hoping this can polish out. And also on the paintwork down the side here, I'm not 100% sure what's happened, but maybe this is like brake fluid or something that's been wiped over the car, or I don't know particularly, but it doesn't look good and you can feel it. So again, I'm hoping I can polish this off. And this is my field of expertise, so if anyone can do it, it's gotta be me. And thankfully it's good news on both. The mirror is more or less there, just off one quick pass. I think one more should get that looking absolutely spot on, but I'm not too worried about that at the moment. And the same on the door, you can see so clearly where I've polished and where I haven't. That is thankfully the paint on the door save. Well, actually it's more than just the door save because it goes onto the rear quarters and the door on the other side and the rear quarter on the other side. So if that didn't come off from polishing or wet sanding, that would have mean having the whole car pretty much painted. So I need the front end done, I need then the sides done and I'd need the rear bumper done anyway. So you're pretty much doing a full respray by that point. So that's definitely saved a lot of money. Now, when it comes to the interior on this car, there is something which is gonna make it challenging. And that's because of all the materials in this car, which are pretty, 
individual to this car as well because it's got this really nice unique spec with the Alcantara and the blue stitching I don't think I'm gonna find that on just any f-type and the last thing I'd want to do is lose that because it's one of the things which sold the car to me in the first place and made it stand out like a sore thumb and scream that I've got to buy this car here's my thinking I'm hoping what I can do is use any old Jaguar f-type dashboard because I believe they're all the same I'm not a hundred percent sure and then what I can do is transfer over the sections where the material is individual to this car so say for example this part here Hopefully I can take that off and then put that on the new dashboard or if I can't do that Maybe I can take it to a trimmers and they can remove that leather and stitching and put it on the new dashboard for me I don't know if that's a bit of a long shot But I feel like that's the best option to retain this really nice interior But the reason why I'm sharing this information with you guys about the actual parts for the car is because with the Aston Martin or the TT For example, there wasn't too many revisions and it was quite simple finding the exact perfect part for the car with no stress or worries. But with this one, because of how rare they are, I think there's only like 400 UK cars that were made. Finding these parts is gonna be difficult and also deciphering what is an SVR specific part and what isn't, isn't gonna be easy either. So I wanna share that part of rebuilding the car with you too. So I'd like to welcome you to the back of house things. This is the part that you guys wouldn't normally get to see because it's one thing just being able to ring up the dealer with a massive parts list and it arrived within a few days. But in the real world, this is what you'd probably be doing if you were rebuilding a car too. Now there is a few parts which have been surprisingly easy to find and I'm quite happy about that. So we found a facelift Jaguar F-Type SVR from Bumper and that's £349, which I don't think is too bad, but it is red, so we're gonna have to get it painted, but that's going in the basket. Unfortunately, the grill, there isn't a matching part number for sale, but I have found this pair of F-Type headlights for quite a reasonable £875, but it's collection only. I have rang the guy up and said I'm happy to cover the cost of postage and a little bit extra, which I think is completely fair, but he wants a bank transfer only and not to go through PayPal or eBay because there's too many scammers, which to me sounds a little bit suspect. So I don't know whether I'm gonna go for that because I'm all for saving money because that's a pretty good price but I also don't want to get scammed. The airbox bracket I have managed to find, but there's two things. One, the part number is the same apart from on here, it begins with an E, and on my list, it begins with a J. So that, I probably need to double check just off the car to make sure that's right. But the other problem is this is in the US, so it's gonna take forever to get here, and also there's gonna be import costs and things like that. So I may be better off going to the dealer for this part. I've managed to find a airbox off a F-Type 5 litre, and it actually says in the description it's from an SVR, and the part numbers match what I've got, and it's on a starting bid of 100 pounds. So I think I'm just gonna throw an offer on it and see what comes back. Now this one's a little bit strange. This is the passenger inner metal part of the wing. There is none of those for sale, but there is plenty of outer plastic wings from this one breaker so it might be worth me calling those and seeing if they've got any but there isn't any listed on ebay it's only the plastic one but i do need one of those and it's only 100 pounds so i think i'll get that ordered there is a few single wheels kicking about which is a good thing because i only need that one front one the rest of them just need a refurb so i'm not going to be buying a full replacement set and the rears definitely seem to be cheaper than the fronts even though they're wider i don't know what that says about the car but i think the one that i'm going to go for is well, it's gonna be this one here. 298 pound, let's get it in the basket. This part unfortunately is expensive, which is the whole corner of suspension with the drive shaft and all the arms and everything that I'm gonna to need to make sure that corner is completely okay with no warm bushings or damage to any parts, which I wasn't aware of, which I think is probably just the safest way to go. So, 1440 pound. It's going in the basket. Now, with the bonnet, I'm struggling to make out whether this is the right one. I'm 90% sure it is because it's got the vents more towards the middle of the car, and you guys told me that all of the all-wheel drive ones fit the SVR. So I hope you're right, but it's not in perfect condition. It's black, it's got quite a few scratches, but we're gonna have to have it painted anyway. So that's not the end of the world, but it's not particularly cheap either. It's 900 pound, which is quite a lot of money and also can't be posted, which means I have to drive to London and back to get it, which is like a four plus hour round trip. So I'm gonna leave that one in the watch list for now and come back to it later. Apologies if you guys aren't enjoying this bit, but I wanted to try something a little bit different and just share with you the full part of building a car and what it actually entails rather than just the work on the car too, because it is really challenging and I'm sure some of you guys 
appreciate there is a lot more to it than just bolting stuff onto a car. Over the last week or so, I've learned quite a lot, not just about my Jaguar F-Type SVR, but also about the world of rebuilding cars, and everything is not quite what you'd expect. You have to be careful, really careful, because there's people out there that will take advantage of you, and not necessarily do you the deal that you think you're getting. As we already know, I need plenty of parts to fix my crash damaged F-Type. And because this car has the potential to be so expensive, I've been really, really careful with what I'm buying to make sure, one, that it's exactly right, and two, that it's the best price I can get it for. But let me tell you, finding parts for this car still hasn't been easy because even when I found the right thing, it turns out that it wasn't the right thing. So for example, oh no. I found this wheel and got it ordered. But again, two days later, that seller contacted me and told me it's a rear wheel, not a front wheel, like it was advertised, so I had to cancel the order. But it's not all bad news, because I have managed to find some parts, and some have been delivered, so we can get started. The first one being this math sensor. Now, from Jaguar, this was £250, but I managed to search the part number off the one from the passenger side and find this for just £50, brand new. It's still a genuine Bosch part, so it's exactly the same thing that you'd be buying from Jaguar, just without main dealer tax, so this can go straight on the car. Not that I can do that much with it because the wires for the math have all been ripped out so I need to replace that and also I need a Jubilee clip which I haven't got. But progress is progress and we're making steps in the right direction. Next up is something I'm not 100% sure on whether I just need to change one or I need to change the pair but I'll let you know why in just a second. To make sure I don't lose the cable from these actuators down into the abyss I just tape it up while I'm swapping them over. Now this is the next piece, this is the BDS actuator and well it shouldn't look like this, it should be sort of well, like that. So the one on the driver's side, like one of you mentioned in the last video, it actually looks okay. So I may be able to get away with just changing this one, but we'll have to wait and see. But this one definitely needs doing. So let's change it over. After swapping over the bracket from the top of the old one to the top of the new one, I can then bolt it in with the four bolts that it takes to fit it and the single electrical connector. And that's the new BDS actuator installed and hopefully the only one we have to do. Then we also need a front bumper, just like this one. This is an SVR specific part, so it's hard to find, but there was plenty of them listed on eBay, so I got one ordered. I picked this red one here. Again, this turns out it wasn't an SVR bumper. It was just listed incorrectly, so that seller has actually shipped that one and I have not received it and it's been like 10 days and I've not been able to send it back to get my money back either so I've been done over a little bit there. But essentially they've said before they can refund me I need to send the old one which they've shipped back which I've not received so I don't know what's going to happen there. And those are just the parts that I can find. There's some parts that I can't find secondhand for love nor money. So I had to go direct to the dealer for this. And I had a really good conversation with them. And I spoke to a guy called Shane at Jaguar Land Rover in York, surprisingly. He actually contacted me through Instagram. And he was super helpful with helping me find all of the bits for my car. And he was so helpful, he actually filled all of my garage up with parts after taking a large sum of money off me. And let me tell you what, I'm so happy that I spoke to him. Because not only was their service great, but they actually did me a better price than what breakers did and to me that's taken the mickey a little bit and this case here shows exactly why you've got to be super careful when you're buying second hand parts because even though you think you're getting a deal because they're off a crashed car or whatever it may be that might not always be the case now i did have quite a few examples with this but we use this as the first one so here we've got bonnet hinge that's a single hinge for 107 pound and it actually turned out that direct from jaguar these parts were a fraction of the price of that and they come pre-unpainted so you can paint them to your car without worrying about the paint chipping off and showing the old color so instead of me spending 107 pound on just one in this example i think they were about 34 pound each so that just made so much more sense to do that and it actually turned out to be the case for most of these parts in here because the breakers seem to want more for these than what they were brand new. Which I think is a little bit of a con that some of these companies can get away with charging more for second hand parts than what they are brand new. But times are hard and some businesses need to do stuff like this to make money, which is the sad truth of it. But we've got a lot secured now, we've made some great progress on the parts finding, but we really need to get on with fitting some of this to the car. And these are the parts I'm going to start with. So the first thing we have are the two bonnet hinges, we have a new airbox bracket for the driver's side, we have a new support bracket for that, for the driver's side. And then we have these two bits as well, which I've not covered yet. So this piece here replaces this one just here, if you can see that. And then this one here replaces that one there. Now the only problem with these straight away for a starting point is the ones on the car are painted and these ones are not. So they need to be color coded 
to the rest of the car. But the actual finish of these parts really isn't that important because you can't see them once the car's all bolted together. And the only reason they are painted, I think, from factory is because they're kind of painted whilst it's all bolted to the car. So it's just almost like overspray more than anything else. But I want to do one better and just get them that little bit nicer. So I spray them with a few coats of Velocity Blue, followed up by some clear coat once that's dry. And the finish actually turned out pretty well considering I was spraying outside in less than ideal conditions. I think it's definitely better than what you'd have got from the factory. So we can't complain about that. But I did have to wait for these to dry so we could do some other bits first. So the first bit that we're going to change is this kind of bit here which runs just in between the bumper and the bonnet and kind of is partially mounted by the crash bar it's it's not bad but it's not perfect and i want to make sure this build is 100 percent so if, rather than making this one work we're going to replace it with a brand new part which i've just already painted Nice. <laughs> so we've got the new parts freshly painted, ready to go on, and the paint job on this isn't the best, but if you compare it to the side, which is actually okay, I'd say it's better than that. So I've definitely done it a little bit better, but you know, we won't get into that. But quickly first, I just wanted to whip off the bonnet because I thought there was a risk of damaging the new painted parts we put on when removing this. There was only four bolts at the bottom of each hinge which held it onto the hinges itself, and as soon as those were off, we could take them off the car. Then these hinges are also bent, so they need replacing, so three bolts gets those off the car too. Don't look at my hair, man. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to paint the crash bar with uh, just some direct gloss black because the old crash bar was satin black. I didn't want to leave this one silver because that's the color it came. And I just thought it might look a bit B-Tech to be able to see that through the grill. So we're gonna do this at least a bit nicer than the standard crash bar came, then no one can moan. I think that's gonna look pretty damn good if you ask me. And there we go, one much nicer than factory crash bar. And now we can really get to work. Once those blue parts were dry, we could then start fitting them up to the car and getting everything in position ready for the new crash bar to go on. We'd already swapped off the little rubber stoppers over from the old one into the new one and then we can start bolting it down. And there were six bolts holding this in place, four at the front from the top and then two at the back from the bottom. So there is the finish on old crash bar, which is not looking 10 out of 10. And there is new crash bar, that's much better. And then it was time for new crash bar to meet new home and this then finally clamps in the rest of those parts which we just painted and fixed. Fitted. There was eight 13 mils which hold it to the crash can and then also a few 10 mils which clamp in those other parts which we've just replaced. So the final bit of damaged kind of structural stuff is this bracket here which kind of goes in between the crash can and the inner leg and also it holds the air box and the headlight too and as you can see here it's split, it's not looking good but we have got another one. <laughs> Don't think it's supposed to be like that. <laughs> And here is my freshly painted new one, which again, just look at the difference in quality there. Sometimes I amaze myself. And then I can line it up with a bit on here that's not been painted. So I haven't got the old bolts for this airbox bracket, but this one will have to do for now. I think it will just grab it enough to hold. There's one. Not a permanent thing, but just to give you an idea, it will do for now. Look at the paint job on that. Phenomenal. So just the horn left to go onto the back of the crash bar and that pretty much finishes off the front end for the stuff that we can do it in this video. But from here we can pretty much start bolting body panels back onto the car and it will start looking more and more complete. So I'm surprised really with just those few little bits how easily it's starting to go back together. And then the final bit which went through the slicks paint shop is the bonnet hinges. So these can go on and then we can move forward onto the next bit. So the next stage to get the car driving right is sorting out this corner of suspension. We've got some severe damage to the bottom of the hub uh, and also as well with the fact the whole thing was in an impact, there's a damaged bush. I just think it's best off to change this whole corner of suspension. So this is what I've been and bought. It's a complete corner of suspension from a Jaguar F-Type SVR. So it comes with the drive shaft and everything else I'm gonna need apart from the disc and the caliper, which I've obviously already got. I bought that second hand because it did work out quite a bit better than buying all the parts new from Jag and it should be pretty simple 
simple than just swapping that over from that one. Should just be 10 or so bolts and we should be able to get that changed over and then the car should actually drive all right. So it should in theory just be a nice simple case of take this one off, transfer over the disc and the caliper and fit this one up. But already we've noticed that there's a problem with this drop link here and that's seen better days. So we're just gonna take that off and leave it off for now and put a new one of those in later when I eventually get one. It sounds like it should be so easy, but I'm sure there's gonna be something to make it hard work. So the first thing that we have to do in order to get this off is take the brake caliper off. So that means that there's two 15s, I think, on the back of there. And then we can get that off from the disc. Then that gives us access to the track rod end, which we have already replaced anyway because we've fitted a new steering rack. And once those are off, we can then start looking at the other lower arms and seeing exactly how those are going to come out. I don't know about you guys, but this just felt like the much better way of doing it, replacing all of these arms and hubs and uprights and everything like that. It just seems like a much safer idea to me. Now, I'm not 100% sure of the technical name of these, but a 21mm nut and bolt then released the front lower arm, and then the kind of mid-back lower arm came out with the same 21mm too. Boom. Well, I, that's not supposed to do that. <laughs> so this bit's a little bit awkward. We've got everything underneath undone, but up here, there ain't a lot of room to play with. So we've got one bolt here and one bolt here for that upper wishbone. And well, come and take a look at how tight this is. So, oh, ow. <laughs> so just, where is it? Is that it there? Where's my finger on it? Yeah, you can't, yeah. you, can you not see? Somewhere down there is a bolt for one of the wishbones. You can't see it. It's down there anyway, but you can see why it's a bit awkward. The good news is you only need a 19mm spanner to be able to get them off. And then once I've got that off, it's unplugged the sensor here for the shock, undo these four bolts, and everything should come loose. So it's got a bit of spanner in there, you know what I mean? If I drop this nut, it's not going to be a good day. Let's put it that way. I'm going to have to take so much stuff out to retrieve it if I do. And there's a very high chance I'm going to do it. <laughs> oh Jesus, I'm, I'm actually nervous. <laughs> I'm actually nervous. If I take this plug off here, that might make it easier. Okay, that's been it all. I should have just done that all along. <laughs> that honestly is not even a worry now. Here she comes. So with the final bolts coming out, we could then release the shock absorber from the car, which actually brought the rest of that complete corner of suspension with it. Mechanics! This is the main reason why I'm not just replacing the drive shaft. If you look here, the hub has actually been, well, like ripped out of itself. So that should, there, that should sit in there and never come off. And as you can see, it has come off. So I just feel like it's safer to replace all of the arms, all of the suspension, just everything off a car that's not had any damage in that area. And you know that the car is gonna be safe. Then it was time to refit all of the new suspension. So we tried fitting it exactly as it came off, but it didn't quite work. We actually had to remove the shock from all of that so we could fit the arms up first because we couldn't get the bolts in for that top wishbone with the shock in place. So once we got those bolts in place, we could then slot the shock back into its sleeve and then start tightening all of the bolts for everything back up. I'm also curious what you guys think I should do with the calipers. I'm not 100% sure on the red caliper with the blue paint combo. Let me know in the comments below what colour you think I should do them. So once we'd smashed through tightening everything back up, I then realised that we'd actually trapped the brake line for the caliper behind the track rod end when it actually needs to go around the back of it and I was not happy about this. No! That's long. But once I'd undone the track rod end and then moved it around, everything was back where it should be and we could get the caliper and disc refitted to the car. Well, that has absolutely ruined me. It's all sorted now. We do still need a drop link though because the old one was no good. The new corner of suspension didn't come with one, but I'm sure it's gonna be relatively inexpensive, so. It's not urgent, I can move the car around without it, it's absolutely fine. To get this new wheel on, it's gloss black, not grey like the other ones unfortunately, but the other ones need a refurb anyway, so I can get them all refurbed to whatever colour. And we've also got a matching tyre. It's a part worn, but it's a P0, exactly the same brand and also the same tread depth as what's on that side, so I haven't got to change both. Now some parts I've managed to find and I've ordered and they've arrived, but other things have been a little bit more tricky. Take for example this rear diffuser which I need on the car at the moment. I ordered this one which is about half the price of what it would be from the main dealer, but instead 
I got this. This is a set of door hinges for... Hello? Hi, is that Chris? Yes, it is. Hi, it's Tracy calling. It's a fucking skirt bumper thing. If you haven't received that by first thing Monday morning, give me a ring back on this number and ask for Tracy. All right, Tracy. And I'll uh, shed some blood. <laughs> yeah, no worries. <laughs> Bye, right, then. have a good one. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Well, that was Tracy from the same company which actually shipped me these door hinges and that seems now that my diffuser is on its way. So that was a perfectly timed win. So while we're waiting for that to arrive, let's go and take a look at some of the other bits which we've got to fit to the Jag ASAP. So earlier in this video I mentioned about that bumper that had to get cancelled because it was the wrong one that was listed incorrectly so I have had to buy a different one but unfortunately there was none for sale on eBay anywhere in the world apart from one in Lithuania which was £2,000 coming with all the grills and everything but then there'd be import duty, postage, loads of stuff on top of that which is going to ramp the cost up to like probably two and a half grand or over. So in this case, it did definitely work out cheaper to get one brand new from Jaguar. Even though this doesn't come with all the grills, we've still got some of the grills and some of the parts available off this bumper for one side, so we only have to buy them for that side. Now that bumper was not cheap, it was about 1,100 pound bare, so I still need to get the grills and everything to go with it. So that definitely hurt the budget quite a lot. In this box here, we have a side skirt. There was none available second hand. But I didn't think this was too badly priced at about £500 or just under, actually. I thought that was pretty reasonable. That's what I'd have thought it would have been second hand. So I think that's actually okay. Then packaged up in here, we have the second part of the rear diffuser. Again, this was cheaper to buy it brand new than it was second hand. There was breakers selling these for £800, painted in the wrong colour where a gloss black one direct from Jaguar was just under that. So it made so much more sense to buy this one. So I don't want it to come across like I'm saying all breakers are bad and they're the devil because they're definitely not. They've definitely saved my skin a few times already on this build. All I'm saying is just be careful how you spend your money and make sure you're getting as good a price as what you think you are. And then in here we've got a bunch of miscellaneous bits for the grills. We've got some foam parts for the back of the bumper. We've got a new wiring loom for the front bumper. And again, all of this was actually pretty reasonably priced. But there is some bits from Jaguar which are not reasonably priced. So take, for example, this dash. This is over £3,000 just for the top section trimmed as mine is. Which I am definitely not going to pay. The steering rack, which we've already changed, that was just under £3,000. And also these air boxes. I can't remember exactly, but I remember them being enough for me to say that I don't want to buy them brand new. I think they were over 500 quid. So on this wing here, there's two parts on the SVR model. And I can show you on the driver's side. So there's a plastic outer wing and then a metal inner wing. I've managed to find one of these outer wings, no problem, second handed. It was only £100, which I think is an absolute bargain, considering they only come on an SVR. But the inner wing is a big problemo. Now, there is none of these for sale anywhere in the UK second hand, and with Jaguar, they're on back order indefinitely. So it may not even be possible for me to get one. Now, you'd think because I live in England and Jaguar are an English company that they'd be able to get every single part with no problems. Well, unfortunately, that's not the case. But if they can get one, they've told me the price, and that is £750 for that tiny bit of metal wing just there, which is absolutely ridiculous, but... It may be my only option, and it may not even be an option in that because they can't get it, and they've got no date on when they can get it. So at the moment, the parts hunt is well and truly still on. We still need a dashboard, and we still need to do something about that wing because without that, I can't finish the car. So that could be a really big problem for me. But at least we've still got plenty to be getting on with right now. In theory, at this point, I should be able to start bolting body panels back onto the car, but that's not the case. And the main reason for that is this wire in here. Because we're missing the plug for the headlights and also the plug for the math sensor, which is here, we can't start reassembling the full car. And I'm scratching my head with what to do with that exactly, because to buy that part from Jaguar, including the new jump point box, is a thousand pound. And that's because you're not just replacing this part here, you're replacing the whole piece of loom from kind of back there somewhere to up here. So that's why it's expensive. So while I try and figure out a solution for that, that's going on hold. So that means that we're going to have to turn our attention to a job which I am definitely not looking forward to. And that is the interior. Obviously the interior is actually in quite good condition. All the leather and everything's nice, but the airbags have gone on the dash and the steering wheel. Luckily no curtain or seat airbags, it's just those two. 
So I've got to try and sort this out somehow. And this is where things carry on getting silly because a new dashboard in this specification, which you can't order brand new anyway, it's going to be made to order, I believe, is over £3,000. And I don't want to spend that on just a dashboard because then still I've got to buy the airbags and everything like that. So I'm going to be like four, £5,000 into replacing this interior, which I don't know about to you guys, but that just seems a little bit ridiculous. I think what I'm going to try and do first, well, I haven't actually got a dashboard, so we need to go and get one. So I'm going to go and see a guy called Dan who I've been talking to on Instagram and he's got something special and he's going to be able to help me out with a few parts and you'll see exactly why. So it's time to fire up the trusty caddy van and head down to somewhere near Essex. How cool is this? So this is a one-off F-Type. It's an F-Type LM. So this was built for a Le Mans race in 2014-ish, but it actually never ended up being completely finished and has ended up here. So engine-wise, it remains roughly the same apart from with forged internals and a bigger supercharger making somewhere between 650 and 700 horsepower. But the body itself of the car has been widened by eight inches to make room for bigger, wider wheels and also completely custom suspension with all new arms and, well, everything. And then this is the main difference right here. So the car isn't going to have a windscreen or a roof. It's going to be open top with no windscreen. So all the bugs will be going straight in your face. But from here backwards, everything else is going to have to be custom because there is no F-Type with a back end like this. So that's going to be a lot of work. So this here is the hub for the car. As you can see, it looks nothing like one off an F-Type. And that's because this car is going to be using center locking wheels. So it only has one wheel bolt, essentially a wheel nut, should I say. And that is nothing like an F-Type. All of these arms are mounted in completely custom places, so there's not really much F-Type left. So I just want to give a massive thank you to Dan for letting me have a look around this car and also letting me have a rummage around through his parts bin. So Dan is essentially converting that car from what was supposed to be just a race car into a road legal F-Type LM. So he's got a hell of a job on his hands, but I'm looking forward to see exactly what he does with it. So I am now back and Dan has hooked me up with a bunch of parts, but the main thing that he's sorted us out with is the dashboard. So this is a complete leather dash, which is not what I need for my car because mine has kind of swayed here, swayed all over here, swayed here, swayed everywhere and blue stitching which this one doesn't but this panel here where the airbag goes is the same now the great news is for you guys if you're following the same journey as me and rebuilding an f-type dan has got two cars worth of parts that he's going to be selling i'm going to leave a link to his instagram in the description and down here as well so here is my plan of action i've got one dash here which i can use for reference to know where the bolts are for the one that's in the car and I'm going to have to just take that one out and then see what i can do to make the stuff of that dash fit this dash or vice versa, or just make something work so I can keep that individually specced SVR interior. Whether it's gonna work or not, I have no idea, but the first thing I've gotta do regardless is get the broken one out, so that is the first stage of the process. If I'm being real with you, I've been dreading doing this because I've never done a dashboard in my life. I hate dealing with interior trims at the best of times, and this is about as fiddly as interior jobs get, so I've just gotta do it, work my way through it bit by bit, and hope that I don't break too much. So I then set about dismantling the full interior of this Jaguar F-Type, starting with all of the clip-on panels. Now I have had a little bit of help here in the form of an email from someone that used to work at Jaguar, I believe, and they said that you can just remove the top section of the dash, but there is still quite a lot to remove, but as far as dashboards go, apparently they can get a lot worse than this. So the next thing that I had to remove was the kind of full centre console and infotainment system, so all of the trims come off, which reveals a bunch of t20 screws there's countless amounts of them so it's just a case of undoing all of those and hoping stuff pops out and luckily they did i managed to get the screen out which was a good start and then carry on undoing those t20s and started to remove more and more from the interior of the car now i did find something that worked quite well for me was kind of nipping to and from bits if i got stuck on something not to dwell on it for too long to try taking something else off and then coming back to it in a little bit because otherwise i think you can very quickly lose your head doing a job like 
like this. So there is part of the infotainment system removed and also the trim beneath the steering wheel. The next thing I want to do is the kind of center vent which comes out of the dash. It's quite a common thing for these to fail so I'm going to have a look at this while it's off the car and see if I can repair the system which makes this come up and down. So the first thing that comes off it is the speaker trim and then this reveals a bunch of again T20 screws which hold in the speaker and also this trim too. And some of these were a little bit concealed so I had to get like a longer screwdriver with a T20 bit on it to get down to those because they weren't the easiest to see either. It's not the first time I've been told I need a longer tool. And that was the rear part of that vent loose and ready to come off the car but it was still secured at the front so I did find some more T20 screws at the front here near where the screen sits and once those were out I could unplug the heater vents and get it off the car. The next thing I wanted to try and remove was these kind of side handles that go around the centre console and all around there. I don't know the proper name for them, but they were quite tricky to get off. Not as easy as what you'd think. So to get these off, what I had to do was remove the gear stick trim. This is kind of the first layer to this, which reveals a couple of bolts, but there's some more underneath the second one. And to release that, you have to take the trims off the side of the kind of centre console. And the only way to get that off on the passenger side is by taking the glove box out. So that was the next job to do. Luckily this was not too challenging to be fair, there's four bolts holding the glove box in, two inside it and two underneath it and a couple of electrical connectors and then the glove box was free from the car. I'm praying that when I put all this back together with the new dash that the glove box works flawlessly because I couldn't get it to shut before but we'll see. The only thing holding the driver's side on was a couple of clips so we could pull that off and then we could concentrate on the passenger side one which is a bit more complicated. We were struggling with this trim for a little while but after a bit of playing around Liam got the hang of it. One. What do you reckon to that? Oh, that was absolutely sensational. So how did you do it? Just pulled it. Oh, okay. Literally just went like this. <laughs> nice, that's an hour wasted then. And once that was off, that revealed the last six bolts that we need to take off to remove the kind of gear stick trim and get to those last final few bolts holding that little handle in place. And then the last thing we need to do before we start taking the bolts out for the dash is taking the clocks out because there is a couple of bolts behind here which hold the dash to the frame. This was an absolute doddle, a couple of trims and one bolt hold this in and then just an electrical connector on the back. There's been nothing so far which has been too difficult really in regards to taking the dash out but I am dreading putting it back in because remembering how it all goes back together is a completely different story. So then it was time to take out the bolts which hold the top of the dash to the frame and I think there was about between 10 and 12 bolts that do this so it wasn't too bad. Most of them are pretty accessible apart from the ones right at the top by the windscreen which weren't the easiest to get to but still perfectly fine. So then the dash was loose and it was jiggling around inside the car ready to come out. So we got in position, set the cameras up and pulled the dash outside of the car. Thank God that is finally done. There was a few wires that we would forgot underneath the dash on the passenger side. But after those were disconnected, it came straight out. I had definitely been worrying about doing this and been overthinking it as well. So it was actually not too bad once you got stuck into it. You got it? Yep. <sighs> So once we were happy that the frame of both the dashboards did match up, we could then turn our attention to the last airbag which had deployed in the car, which was the steering wheel one. This was actually really easy to do. Two holes in the back of the steering wheel, stick a screwdriver in there, and then release the spring, and it came off the car. But I did have a problem here. Oh, they melted there, that's the question. Where's that little pick? So what can happen sometimes when an airbag deploys is that the plugs melt to the airbag itself because it's got so hot when that explosion happens and unfortunately that has happened in this case so I'm not going to be able to release these plugs off the airbag with ease so I'm going to have to cut the cables so we're going to have to replace that section of loom at a later date but then we can remove the earth and then that airbag is off the car as well. Easy. Light work. Light work. Light work. So there is old dash out of the car and here is the new one. As you can see, there is some differences. So this has the suede top with the blue pipe and blue stitching where this one does not. So we want to try and get this stuff off here and put it on here before that goes back in the car. And I'm not able to do that, but Liam is. 
Why can't you do it? So we've now got both dashes out of the car and I need to take them to a local trimmer to see what we can do with it. So I'm gonna go and try a few local places and hopefully someone's gonna be pretty positive and we can get them turned around pretty quickly because the key here is speed because I need to be able to remember how it all goes back together. And even though I've filmed it, it's not always the most helpful. It's, I've gotta keep it fresh in my brain so we need to get this done fast. So I then load up the new dash and the old dash into the van and go hunting around Leicester to see what trimmers I can find that want to tackle this job. So that is the dash now dropped off with a company called Auto Trim which are in Beaumont Lees in Leicester so not too far from me and hopefully they can sort the dash out pretty sharpish but it's not going to be an overnight thing unfortunately. I was kind of hoping to be able to do it like ASAP but They'll get it done pretty quick, I'm sure. I've got faith. So we've got to find some more stuff to do on the Jag. But luckily, Dan has given us some more parts than just the dashboard. So we have also got a new steering wheel airbag. We've got a little elbow for up here, which isn't the right part looking at it. Oh, well, so that doesn't matter. Um, we've got some new sensors for up here. These are basically like a bonnet and latch sensor, I believe. So I think I need to change those over. Which shouldn't be too bad. You can kind of see where it is there. So yeah, that needs doing. I've got two new wheel arch liners. I've got this plastic section here, which I believe goes about, goes somewhere there. And he has also sorted us out with a new air box as well, which is very, very handy. But it does mean that I didn't need to buy this math sensor just here. So that was a bit of a waste of money, but it worked out around the end. So I can actually remove this bit of intake pipe here, which had a very, very small amount of damage and I wasn't gonna change it to be honest, but I've got a new perfect one, so I may as well stick that one on instead. So all I had to do was get this one in position, but it didn't wanna quite go in as easily as you'd expect. So I ended up splitting it into two parts, the muff and that top section of pipe, fitting that and then fitting the airbox to that into the rubber grommets, which mount it to the car. One job down, on to the next one. So let's have a look at these bonnet release sensor things. I think these basically just operate to tell you whether the bonnet is open or closed, and I believe they get damaged when the car is involved in a crash. So better to be safe than sorry, and just to replace them, then I know I'm not gonna have anything to worry about. Hopefully the actual latch itself is perfectly fine. I can't see a reason why it wouldn't be though. But after five minutes of spanner in, that's done as well. So where are we up to? Let's have a quick recap before we carry on. We've got the dash out and at the trimmers, waiting for that to come back so we can put that back in with the new airbag. We have got the new uh, bonnet sensors in, we've got the airbox on, and now we're waiting for a solution on the wiring for this headlight and muff, and also waiting for the wing for the passenger side. So we are getting there, but there's some hurdles to get over. So as you can probably tell by the state of my garden, it's the bumper where we're gonna be turning our attention to next. And we've actually got three of them. I've got this brand new one here from Jaguar, which is an SVR bumper. I've got the original SVR bumper off the car, which is obviously heavily damaged, but I've also got this standard facelift bumper as well, which we can use for parts. And speaking of parts, <laughs> we've got even more of those just here. So the next step is trying to build up this new F-Type bumper to make it complete so it's ready to go on the car when the time's right. And it's definitely a bit of a jigsaw. I think the best place to start here was taking the centre grille off this second hand facelift bumper which came with this grille quite handily and luckily the grille is exactly the same on the standard model as it is on the SVR, the only difference is the badge which you can transfer over from one to the other. So once that's removed from that standard bumper I can then stick it all straight into that brand new SVR bumper. Now I've got to say I've never actually bought a bumper brand new from a dealership before so it was quite nice to actually know that everything on there is in perfect condition as you'd expect it would be I know that sounds daft, but it's just like a bit of a novelty thing for me I've never had that before but once the grill was swapped over and bolted into place, then we could start moving on to the next bits. One of the bits that I was keen to get on was the SVR badge, which really identifies this car over a standard one. And then we could start popping in things like parking sensors, but unfortunately at this point, the weather took a bit of a turn. So I dragged the new bumper inside and then started fitting the rest of the grills, the washer jets, and all the trims which go on the back of the bumper too. The ones from the passenger side I managed to save from the old bumper, but the ones for the driver's side are all brand new. So we've got a mixture of old parts and new parts here, but 
Luckily, all of the old ones are in pretty good condition considering it's such a low mileage car, so I don't think you can actually tell the difference. So there is all of the grills in that new bumper, but there is still more to go. Right, the next piece, and the final piece actually of this bumper, which I can do, is the splitter and I can't believe this actually survived the crash but it did and I've still got all the fixings from the old bumper so it should be quite easy to put on. So I pulled all of the clips off the old bumper and transferred them onto the new bumper as I already said luckily somehow the bottom of the bumper completely survived so I was actually able to save all of the fixings and fittings from that bumper and move them over to this one. And now those are in place I can start bolting up the three sections of that lower front splitter and we can now see a complete bumper. And that is the bumper back in one piece and well, let's say one piece, it's made out of about 50, but we got there in the end. Now, there is still some bits I need. I need a washer jet and I need a parking sensor, but we're most of the way there and it is looking the dog's danglies, to be fair. I'm getting excited now. I can start to see kind of the finished picture because I've not seen this car in the flesh looking complete yet, so... I think it'd be rude now not to go and see what this looks like on the car. I don't know why, but sticking that front bumper on just feels like a big deal to me. It just hasn't up until this point felt like I've actually got an F-Type SVR until now. I'm really pumped to get this done. It's so easy to forget while you're so close in on a situation looking at all these little minor problems that realistically the end goal that you're working towards slowly piece by piece is something that not long ago I'd have only dreamt of owning and to me that's a little bit crazy. Especially considering most of it is thanks to this little Halfords toolkit. It's probably the best £200 I've ever spent. And one thing that's even crazier to me that only two years ago or so I'd have been paying someone to do my brake pads and my oil changes and things like that and now I'm taking a dashboard out of a Jaguar F-Type so it just goes to show no matter how stupid you are, you can learn it. But anyway, let's not get too caught up with that. I need to go and pick this dash up. But I've now got my other dashboard back from the guys at Auto Trim Solutions. And they have absolutely nailed it, to be honest with you. So now this is ready to go back in the jag. So Liam's going to help me put the dash back in because a problem shared is a problem halved. And now this is your problem. Thank let's you. go. <laughs> and with that short, sharp intro, we get straight back to work and get that fresh dash straight back in the car. Liam helped me take the dash out of the car, so it's only right he helps me put it back in too, but it is quite a simple one luckily, and is not too bad of a job. The main thing now is just remembering the order that everything goes back together to make sure nothing gets missed out. So we start off with the main bolts which hold the frame of the dashboard to the car itself. I believe there was roughly about 10 of these. And also, obviously, I can't forget plugging in the new airbag. There's one connector on either end of the airbag and also two earths. And while I'm connecting that up, Liam decides to tighten some bolts up on the top of the dash. <laughs> Liam! <laughs> I can't believe you've done this. Oh, no! No! no. Oh, that was so hard to do as well. What have you got to say for yourself? Um, uh, I've accidentally cracked the windscreen. Do you know what's funny? What? Because this would have been easier to do with the windscreen out. Now we've got to take the windscreen out Now anyway. the windscreen's got to come out anyway, and this is going to be done by that point. <laughs> I can't believe you've done this. You're just going <laughs> to... I can. I'm so... <laughs> I'm sorry, Chris. I'm so disappointed. Can I carry, can I carry on with this? You... <laughs> so on and it was all going so well. <laughs> Do you know what? Sometimes a problem shared is a problem doubled. <laughs> so now Liam has basically written off my car all over again, we can continue putting the dash back together. So next to go in is the clocks. These are simple, you just plug them in and there is three bolts holding them in. One at the top that goes into the little cover and also two into the frame of the dashboard. Now while I'm fitting this, Liam is fitting up the poo yourself handle. This is because when you're planting it in this car, the passenger needs somewhere to hang on to for dear life. Now we did have a little bit of difficulty lining this up at first, but that was because we had the gear stick kind of trim and all of that sort of stuff in the wrong place. Once we've got that position right, it went in a dream and we can get all of the bolts in. So uh, now we're getting on the limb. We're having a good time. We're having an absolute smashing time. Yeah, we are absolutely smashing through it, to be fair. We're making a cracking job of it. So far, <laughs> I actually don't think we've we've missed a bolt. I don't think we've missed a bolt. No. But we'll find out at the end. We will find out. It'll cause me a splitting headache if 
we do have any that's, you know, left. <laughs> Can we stop with the puns now? <laughs> do you feel guilty? No, not now. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm still a little bit bitter because Liam broke my windscreen. I'm not sure if I mentioned that or not, but anyway, I think the only thing that's going to fix that is time. And also, if you guys at home, make sure you hit that subscribe button because that really helps things. Silver one there. Look for a black one there. A black one there. Now, probably the most awkward thing here is remembering the exact order that everything goes together because it only goes together in one particular order. So we did end up taking things in and out a few times to make sure it was actually going together correctly in the end. Okay, there is the five that kind of hold this gear stick thing in place, but we didn't know which ones should be silver and which ones should be black. What have you done, Liam? You've done the same as me. I've done... I've you got black, black at the front. I've done black there. Yeah. And then directly opposite it, Low down, I've done silver. Yeah. And then above that, I've done black. Yeah. And then the one this side, I've done silver. Is a full house. Smashing job. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Be careful not to crack it. Everything is going pretty swimmingly. Everything is going back together. But we have misplaced two of the cables down here when they should be up here. So we need to try and hopefully get those out from wherever they are and then tuck them back up to where they need to be and then we're back on course. So this is more or less i think the last bit before well we've got the screen to go in as well and the the dash vents but the glove box is so that'll make it the third last bit is that right liam my maths isn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> i did what i was kind of hoping when i put the glove box back in it was just going to work but i don't think that's going to be the case because well it's still not latching even when it's not on the car so i think i'm gonna have to replace this but i can't imagine this being expensive because it comes on well every f type so it should be nice and easy this time. It's not worked. <laughs> Even though we had to take things in and out a few times to get them together in the right order, progress is progress and we just had to work our way through it until the car started to take shape again. Which at this point, it's pretty much there. It's just the final finishing trims which cover up all of the bolts that have got to go on and then we can try and start it up for the first time and make sure that everything's working. I genuinely was dreading doing this job and I'm actually glad that it was nowhere near as bad as I thought, which actually tends to be the case with a lot of jobs on most cars, really. It's always the thought of doing it, which is actually worse than just getting stuck in, especially when you've got a helping hand from a mate and just getting it done. My words of advice, if you are going to tackle a dashboard at home, is already have a new dashboard so you can see where all the bolt holes are. Absolutely cracking, mate. And maybe don't borrow Liam to help you do it if you want your windscreen to be in one piece. Okay, so there is the dashboard completoed. We absolutely smashed it out of the park. And to be fair, the bolt score wasn't too bad either. We've got two left over, which I think, I think it's pretty good going, isn't it, Liam? I think. But da as dashes go. As far as dashes go, don't leave me hanging. Oh, I didn't see you. I've got. Um, yes. I think for a first time dash job for us too. I know you've done one or two before. But Two's a good score. Two's a good solid score. I mean, they are quite big ones, that's the only problem. Like, they're not little trim bolts, but, you know, that's, that ain't going nowhere. Solid as a rock. But we have safe lost, it is safe as ours. We have lost one bit, though. There's a little trim which goes just here, and I put it down on camera just here, and uh, it's not there anymore. So, let's see, firstly, whether our installs worked and everything turns on. So, okay. And then I'm going to have a look here. Ooh. SVR. What do you reckon odds on it being down here, Liam? It's got to be beyond one of these seats. And if it's not... It's when you hear a crunch, isn't it? Ding, 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 ding. Liam, is that determined he's gone for the driver's seat as well? I, I've kind of given up, really. I've called it gone, but... I want to find it. Yeah, well, I think you just feel bad for breaking my windscreen still. Hold your hand out. You were right. You didn't want to take this seat I, out. I didn't think it was there. I actually didn't think it was there, mate. But well done. So here is the final piece. Thanks, Liam. Thank, honestly, Liam, thank you. I appreciate that. I don't appreciate you breaking my windscreen, but I appreciate your help anyway. Oh, I'm doing it. There we go. Oh, oh, there we go. And everything seems to be working. I can't see anything that's not. The that screen came on early, didn't it? The the centre screen. This is all working. The clocks are all working. Did uh, did these come up at any point? Oh, you didn't plug it in, did you? What? The plug. For that. You plugged it in. No, I didn't. 
we pulled the plug out, didn't we? So me and Liam took the dash apart again last night, not as far, obviously, just to be able to plug in that centre vent that comes up and down in the dash. But that is now done, and there's only one airbag left. And that is the steering wheel one. You may remember from before, I had to cut these wires because the plugs were melted to the old airbag, and I've got two options in what I can do here. Now, the first option is the slightly sketchy option. I can actually buy the plugs, and I could cut and splice those wires and put the plugs back on, and I could plug it into an airbag, stick it on, and it should, in theory, be good to go. This is what everyone has actually told me to do even someone that works at Jaguar told me this that it's perfectly safe and will not cause a problem but I know you guys at home can be a little bit pedantic and I want this car to be absolutely unquestionably perfect. So what I've done is order a whole new clock spring. The clock spring is the section which goes just behind the steering wheel and allows the wheel to turn with the buttons and the cables you know, without those getting snagged essentially. So I've ordered a new one of those. It comes with new indicator stalks and bits and bobs like that. It was £200, but safety is something you can't put a price on. There is something else that needs doing in here because on these cars they have an airbag ECU which is tucked kind of right down there underneath the center console at the back and you've got two options you can either change it or reset it and to change it obviously i've got to get in there take everything out and to reset it normally i'd have to take it out and well send it off to be reset but we have just made a key for the i30 so while you're here we may as well see if we can reset this ECU whilst it's in the car. I definitely can't promise, but I will definitely try. We can try, it's worth a I'm shot. I'm very good at pressing buttons, <laughs> but I'll press them until it, until it works. Let's give it a go. So we may as well make use of Mark from Premium Bespoke Auto Works and see if he can reset the airbag ECU on the Jag. Right, I don't know if you guys can see this, but there's an outstanding campaign on my car for pass by noise in latch special program mode. So I'm guessing in SVR race mode, that means the car's too loud. I mean, that's just cool, isn't it? <laughs> So Mark plugs in his dongle and starts pressing some buttons and loads some stuff up and sees what he can do with this airbag ECU. It will be an absolute godsend if he can sort this out for me because taking out that airbag ECU will be a nightmare. It's underneath the centre console basically mounted to the body of the car so it would be a right ball ache getting in there. So this is the what? Um, RCM's uh, restraint control module, so basically um, SRS. So that's the restraint. airbag ECU. That's the airbag ECU. So 17 volts in there. Uh, Crash event stored. Full and locked. Test failed, yes. So here is what are we I don't know what we're, we're looking, looking at. at the restraint, <laughs> restraint control module, yeah. Okay. Which is the airbag module. Right, okay. Um, so, so what we've done is we've read the data out, um, we've reset it, and then we've written the data back to it. Okay. So it's fixed. Not that I can tell well, the difference. The airbag's fixed. The, the the airbag's the fixed. The Look, fixed there's still a bit more to no, do, yeah, but to do. that's the airbag ECU reset without taking out the car. So that saves me dismantling the whole interior to get to that, which is a, kind of in between the seats at the back. So it is a bit of a, a completely different place to dismantle than what I wanted to do anyway. Okay, dash is sorted for now. There is a few tiny little bits left to sort on the interior. But we need to finish off this corner of suspension, which we started about a video or two ago. Oh. And that is with this. This is a drop link for the anti-roll bar. So this goes just here between the anti-roll bar and, well, just here with the hub, but I can't get that in at the moment. It is a lovely fit. So this is the final piece to finishing off this corner of suspension. And once this is tight, I can call this bit done. That's the first part of this project finished then. Suspension completoed. Good news. Good news. My new clock spring is finally here. So I say finally, I ordered it and it showed about two days later. So not actually too bad, but we can get that fitted. And this should be a doddle of a job. All I've got to do is take the steering wheel off, which is made even easier because I left the airbag, which had blown out of the steering wheel, which just makes sense. And then that reveals the cowl in which I need to remove, which once that's off, I can then get to that clock spring. 
The cowling did have some hidden bolts in it. It has, I think, two underneath, and then once you get that off, there's three which hold the top one in place, which I thought was a little bit weird, because I think these are normally clipped in. But then once that was off, it was four bolts to get the clock spring off and a few plugs, and then I could put the new one on the car. This is just an exact reverse of what I've already done. So the four bolts go back in, which hold the clock spring on, and then it's just the cowling and the steering wheel to go on. But now this gives the perfect solution for our airbag plug situation, meaning there is no dodgy repaired wires, which could impact the safety of the car in the future. Now just before the steering wheel goes on, that red tab has to come off because then that then holds the clock spring in place to make sure the ribbon doesn't snap, but you can remove that, then put the steering wheel on, tighten the bolt up, and then the final piece is the airbag. Okay, now for the final piece of the steering wheel airbag puzzle, the steering wheel airbag. So, all I need to do is connect this up here. So this blue plug goes to the blue one on the airbag. That's that one. There's the yellow one, it goes to the yellow one. There's that one. They snap into place nicely. And then I've got two earths. There's one just, I don't know which one's supposed to be which. I'm guessing the big one's the big one. That one goes there. And this should, in theory, Yes! That's it. Just to do the horn check. Horn's not plugged in. So everything here seems to be working. The only thing that doesn't seem to work is the horn, but I'm not sure whether this would stop it working. The fact that it's not got a bonnet for some reason or the fact that I've not got the front bumper loom plugged in. Is that gonna make the horn not work? Even though it seems like everything else is... I think that's a strong possibility. If the front bumper's not plugged in, it's a high chance the horn won't work. That's what I'm gonna go with anyway. If it doesn't work, when I get the front bumper all on and assembled, then I know it's something behind here that I've just done then. And the interior is now nearly there anyway, so the only things left are the seat belts and also the glove box I've got to change. I've ordered a new glove box, so that's on its way. And the seat belts, well, I picked some up from Dan with that F-Type LM. Well, I thought I did. I can't remember where I've put them, to be honest with you, so I need to find those because I haven't seen them since I got back so I might have ended up leaving them at his place but knowing me they could be anywhere to be fair so I'm sure they'll show up so on both sides for the headlights there's a small plastic bracket which is just here as you can see on both sides it's also broken so I've got a new one of these ready for some new headlights oh right new one it should go on easy as that I think this also holds the bumper as well as the headlight but I'm not 100% sure but I'm sure it will make a bit more sense as it starts going back together. Now you may remember from the video where I mentioned that I was potentially getting scammed but it turns out it was exactly the opposite to that. The red bumper that I went to order which might be just up here the guy who owns that company actually rang me and really apologized for the situation that happened with that and said if there's anything that I can do to help you out let me know because I might have parts lying around for your car. And I said, well, funnily enough, there is because I still need headlights, a grill, and a rear diffuser. And he said, Chris, no problems. Give me two minutes and I'll come right back to you. And he did. And he came back to me with a headlight, a diffuser for an SVR rear bumper, and the front grill, which you've seen me fit in the last video. And that obviously went swimmingly. Now what we need to try and do is fit these headlights that he's given us to the car. I'm gonna leave a link to his eBay store in the description. He's a good guy, honestly. I think his name's Richard and it's like Car Bumpers 12 or something. My man's a legend. So anyway, now we have a headlight for the car. It does need a bit of a clean up, but if there's anyone that can do that, we know from the past that it is definitely me. So now what we've got to do is clip this headlight into its fixing points. It's got three of them. So we've got one at the top here, one on this bar here and one just here as well. So it should line up pretty easy. Something like, wow. It was almost like it was made for the car. There we go. And then the other one, which we can get to easily, is just there. And it's all coming together now. So now at this point, you'd like to see me test this headlight and I would love to too, but we still have the problem of having absolutely no plug for the headlight and I've looked 
everywhere for one. I've been ringing breakers, I've been looking all over eBay, trawling the internet, and even spoke to someone that deals with the wiring in the SVO department at Jaguar. So basically the person that built the wiring room for this car, he can't get a plug for this headlight for me. So I'm still on the hunt and I cannot plug in this headlight and try it out, which is frustrating. But not as frustrating as these. So this is the F-Type SVR wheel arch liner and well, the price of these is ridiculous. 700 pounds each. So that's 1,400 pounds for two front arch lines, which is just daft. Especially when I've got two F-Type R arch liners for a fraction of that. So this is the F-Type R arch liner, and this is what I've got left of the SVR arch liner. And, well, this piece goes about here, like that, and that piece goes about there. Now you can see, when I line those up, anyway, they're, they're pretty similar. Like, I can't see many differences apart from, well, I'll run you through them. So, the first one is round here. When I line this part up, you can see we've got a massive square missing out of the SVR one that isn't missing out of the R one, which basically fits this little vent here, which I believe is for brake cooling. So, is it possible, do we think, for me to use this as a template and cut a nice square out of here and fit that in there? I'm thinking quite possibly yes. Now, there is some other differences because around the back here, we've been talking about it for a while, the SVR wing comes in a bit more, as we can see from the SVR one compared to the R one. So, I think using this as a template again, I should be able to trim the R one very neatly in an OEM style to make it exactly the same as the SVR one. Still with me? One final bit is round the front here. We can see the SVR arch line has got a slight dimple in where the R1 is completely smooth. It's not massive, it's only small, so I'm thinking with a little bit of heat, I should be able to caress this one and just make it beautifully contour like this 700 pound SVR arch liner for the cost of absolutely nothing. It seems like three very easy little jobs to turn something that is cheap into something expensive and save me just under a grand and a half. Okay, I've just had a parcel delivered and this one's a big deal because this is something that was really holding us back. This is, do you recognize it yet? The wing for the SVR. I had to buy it from Jaguar. It was ridiculously expensive, but it was literally the only place I could get it. I think it was like £700 just for that small bit of metal, which is disgusting, but when you've got no choice, it's one of those things you've just got to do it. So after weeks and weeks of waiting, and we weren't even sure if we were going to be able to get it, the SVR wing did show up from Jaguar, which I could not be happier about. I was very worried that we weren't even going to be able to get this part, and I was going to have to find some alternative solution, which wasn't what I wanted to do. But luckily it did, and all of the bolt holes lined up, and we're on to the next step. Right, I'm just kind of mocking all this up because I want to make sure it fits before I just send everything off to the body shop. I want to make sure I've got everything and that everything's right. But I have also got the second part to the wing, the outer plastic piece. This was much cheaper. This was only about £100. And I'm hoping this fits just as easily as that wing. So there's one kind of locating pin which should get it in the right position. And then it all should just slot into place, which it does sort of seem like it is. So let's get a bolt in up top here. Now, when it comes to fixing the bottom, it doesn't actually bolt from down here. It bolts from inside the arch because that's where the side skirt clips into. So I'm only gonna put one in here. I think there is actually two, but one will hold it for now, no problems, until obviously, as I said, it comes back off to get painted. And that is the second kind of layer to the wing, which is specific to the SVR, also fastened up. I'm relieved. I feel relieved. Now I've got that wing. We are, we're getting close. We are getting close. I'm getting hyped for that first drive. I'm hoping that this Range Rover headlight plug 
can fix all of the problems with the lights on my Jaguar F-Type SVR so we can finally get it to the body shop. Now it's been a long road from finding this car on an eBay listing, crash damaged, buying it and then slowly step by step restoring it to its former glory to this point and the headlights now are the main thing holding me back. That was until I started the car today. As I'll show you right now. So we now have warnings for stability control not available, e-diff not available, two-wheel drive only available, power steering function reduced, all sorts of things that weren't there before. And I'm scratching my head to what could have caused that because when I parked it where it was, it was absolutely fine and only had an engine management light for the MAF sensor which is broken and a headlights warning light for the headlight that's broken and a check pedestrian safety system because the front bumper's missing. It truly is one step forward and two steps back with this car but I'm going to start this video by looking at that headlight plug and thankfully over my time rebuilding this car I have built up some quite close connections within Jaguar and they've sorted me out with this. So this here is the wiring diagram for the right hand headlight so it tells me what what colour goes to what number plug and essentially all I've got to do is match these colours up to the corresponding pin on this one and then just hope it's going to work. And while I'm tackling this mess, the guys are here from Premium Bespoke Auto Works and they have, can I show them? Yeah sure. Okay, sure. so we have a new steering wheel for the Jag because the old one, well actually let's have a quick look at the old one first. The old one just gives me the ick, I can't lie, I don't like the leather on the top and the bottom, I don't like this centre stripe here which is like double thickness and black. I don't like the Alcantara on the sides, but I thought it'd be a shame to ruin this one to retrim it because it's like original spec. So these guys have made up this bad boy. Oh yeah. So what we have, we've got carbon fiber top and bottom, but dry carbon fiber, which is a little bit more subtle. Leather sides with perforated leather and also blue stitching, and it looks sick. So I'm gonna leave these guys to fit this, and I'm gonna try sort this. So I start by trying to re-solder the headlight wires back together with this new plug, which came off a Range Rover headlight. So to repair the headlamp plug, I'm using these connectors, which essentially have heat shrink with a piece of solder inside. All you have to do to use them is put two pieces of wire, one in either end, and then heat it up. It melts the solder and shrinks the heat shrink around the wire. And whilst I'm doing that, the guys from Premium Bespoke Auto Works start fitting the new wheel which they've supplied for my car. The new carbon fibre one with the blue accents is going to be much more in fitting I think with that SVR interior and feel that little bit more special. If you guys do want to grab yourself one of these steering wheels from these guys I'm going to leave their link in the description, they do them to order so you can have them exactly how you want them. But now the headlight plug is rewired and we have the new steering wheel on. Ah, oh, yes, that looks sick. I'm sure it comes down to personal taste slightly, but I think that's a huge improvement over the standard one. But in case the next owner doesn't like this style of steering wheel, I've kept the old one just in case. I like the dry carbon as well. I've only had gloss carbon before and that looks, it's like classy. Now the next thing to check is the headlights. So time to slot on the freshly rewired plug and see if it works. So headlights are now wired, steering wheel is in and we need to check to see whether these headlights are going to work and this is kind of the moment of truth because it could still cost me about two and a half grand for a set of second hand headlights for this car if this one doesn't if this one does then i only need one but if it definitely doesn't work then that might be a fault with the wiring so that might be more of a problem but we'll see in a second Ooh, battery's dead okay it's looking good we've got this headlight working and well, this one doesn't, but this isn't the headlight we're running anyway, so that's not a massive problem. How about the indicators? Do they work? Indicators working that side. How about this side? Yes! Flash me, it's on a full beam. Yeah! Now we have got one problem, which is a little bit strange, and that's with this switch here. So this is a brand new one, which I've fitted, a brand new part from Jaguar. It came with the clock spring, and this is how you turn the lights on and off just here and it just seems to spring straight back to this middle position and I can't figure out why it does that. But I'm sure it's a minor thing. I could take the stalk of the old ones, fit it to this one, and that should fix my problem. So now we have working headlights on the Jaguar. We have a pretty much complete interior, the few final finishing touches. The engine seems to be running pretty sweet, apart from one or two plugs which were ripped off in the accident. 
and we have all of the body panels we need to finish this car off. And some of you guys did point out that it was a bit pointless me reassembling the front bumper when it's only going to have to come apart to go to the body shop and that's kind of why I've left the car as it is now. So it's time we move forward with the build and get this car to the body shop. We have last chance recovery here to take the Jag from its home to the body shop. So let's get on with this video. So the moment that weeks and weeks of hard work have been building up to, finally getting this car to the body shop, even though it still has a few flaws, this will really be the main transformation. So here we are at Dream Ice in Hinkley, and this is where the Jaguar F-Type SVR is going to be painted. So the car more or less looks exactly as it was. The boys have already made a start by stripping off the wing, which I fitted, and also stripping down the front bumper, ready to receive some paint. And also on the back bumper, you may remember, there was a nasty scratch and kind of gouge in this section here, which they've already slapped some filler on, ready to be sanded back, and that can be painted too. And also the first part of the diffuser here, which does need painting because it is looking pretty battered, but that's going gloss black. Now, although the damage on the car was pretty isolated to the front end and a small scratch on the back bumper, we are going to have to do a bit of paint on most of the car just for blending. So that means blending the whole side down here. And also, we're going to do this side as well just to make sure that the job's right. But I'm going to try my best to help out and make a start on this diffuser. And so the bodywork begins and I'm going to make a start on this diffuser and start removing some of the scratches out of it by sanding it down thoroughly with 500 grit to prep it ready for paint. The guys at Dream Ice also filled in some of the deeper imperfections with a light glaze to make sure that once it's painted, it's going to look top notch. And now comes the mammoth task of preparing the whole car ready for paint and it's not a fun process. So for you guys, I'm going to make it short and sweet, but for us, it was days of work. Now, admittedly, I got the easy task of preparing the new panels, which just essentially needed a light scotch down and they were good to go. But the guys at Dream Ice, they had a lot of work on their hands getting the rest of the car prepared. Oh, and if you're wondering where this bonnet came from, I had to buy it from Jaguar because there was none available second hand. So the car was covered in minor imperfections from dents on this C-pillar to minor damage on the front edge of the door. And these guys would not let this ride, so this had to be sorted before the car could be prepped. Now for any of you guys that haven't painted a car before, and that'll probably be most of us because I haven't done it myself either, but the prep is a huge part of the task. You could paint a car quite easily in a day, but preparing a car for paint can take weeks. And that's because there's so much that goes into it. To get the best results, it's all in the prep. So you want to make sure that you're masking right. You want to make sure that the panel is perfectly smooth and has a perfect key ready for that fresh coat of paint. And that's exactly what the guys are doing here. They're making sure that when that paint goes on, there's going to be zero defects underneath it. As always, I'm lending a helping hand as well. So now the parts that I had prepped had come out from primer, we hit them with a guide coat and sanded them again, and they were then ready for base. But while the car's here, I may as well make the most of my time and do some other bits on it as well. Okay, so while the boys are prepping the car for primer, I've got one or two more jobs to do on the car to get it kind of running and driving right. And one of those is this. This is a MAF sensor plug. I was able to buy this directly from Jaguar, unlike the headlight plug, and we're gonna do it in exactly the same way. They've supplied everything that I'm gonna to need to do it, all of the connectors, all of the wire, everything like that. So it should be a simple case of copying of what I've got on the passenger side over to the driver's side. Now luckily this is quite easy to do. All you've gotta do is pop the pins into the plug and then match those wires up with the wires that are remaining on the loom. And Jaguar gave me everything I needed to do that as well. So there is the math sensor now wired in, but I have just started it and unfortunately it hasn't got rid of the engine management light. But that could be down to a few things. So the first thing I'm gonna try is resetting it with like my OBD reader. Second thing I think it w is the wiring. That might be bad. Okay, tell a lie, I've just gone to reset it and I have no longer got an engine management light on. So it turns out the car just needed to chill overnight and then it fixed itself. So now the MAF sensor is sorted, the headlight plug is sorted. So the only warning lights we've got left are bonnet open because we've not got a bonnet on the car. We have a headlight for the passenger side headlight, fuel level low, which I think is gonna be on quite a lot. 
and washer fluid level low, which is an easy fix. Oh, and we've still got one for the airbags, and I think that is just because of the seat belts. So slowly the car is getting closer and closer to that first drive. Now, just while I've got a second, I know earlier in the video I didn't explain the headlight situation very well. So what I've got is I've got a fully working, good condition headlight for the driver's side, but my passenger side headlight, all the mounting points are broken, so I do need to get a new one of those. But I will get that ordered and get it fitted for when this is done. And strangely enough, that whole host of warning lights I was getting earlier for the diff, the suspension, the steering, have all gone as well. The car just must be having a moment because it's dying to be driven and we are so close. So now we can push forward, but one quick thing I could not decide on, and you guys actually helped me out with, was the wheel and caliper colour combo. I put a poll on my Instagram. If you're not following me, you missed out on contributing on this build. My Instagram is just here. Go follow me. But I couldn't decide between doing the wheel silver with a body coloured, so a dark blue caliper, or leaving it roughly in this spec and going for a gloss grey wheel with keeping the red calipers. And, well, it was such a close call. We had great engagement on this, and you guys voted on what I'm going to do, and it was so close. 49% of you voted for silver with blue, and 51 voted for grey with red. So grey with red is what we're going for. So I don't want to hear any moaning about the colour combination because you guys picked it. So if you're not following me on Instagram and you want to contribute towards the builds exactly like that, go follow me and I will do more of it in the future. Oh, and also, if you're not subscribed, what are you playing at? Whack that subscribe button. Now let's get on with it. So it's now about a day or two later and the car is more or less ready to be painted now. We've got all of the priming done on the body where the repairs are, on the door here. Corey's just around the back masking up the exhaust and other things. We've got the repair done on the back bumper, got the repair done on the C pillar and down here on the A pillar and on this corner of the door as well. I've strapped a GoPro to Corey's paint gun and well, let's just see how it goes. Ladies and gentlemen, here it is. The moment we've been building up to for weeks. I can't wait to see this done. But now it's over to Corey to start painting the Jaguar F-Type SVR in Velocity Blue. We've come a long, long way together Through the hard times and the good I have to celebrate you, baby I have to praise you like I should So the Jag is now painted and, well, it looks sick. Take a look at this.
like a shoe. I am blown away. I'm over the moon. That is looking. 10 out of 10, better than I could have expected. So, well, if I'm being honest, I'm a little bit nervous to work on the car now because I don't want to scratch it putting it back together. Well, we're going to leave it for a little time now to cure and to harden up a tad before we start reassembling. Now, bear in mind, this is an off the gun finish. So there's been no sanding and no polishing done yet. And that is why you get little specks like just here. These will need sanding and polishing out, but that is completely normal. And to be honest with you, this needs a lot less sanding and polishing than a lot of paint jobs that I've seen in my time. Because the other thing that you're trying to remove when you're sanding and polishing is the orange peel effect and, well, there really isn't much in this at all. We did sort of come to the decision that painting the whole car, apart from, like, the boot lid, seems like the best option, really. Because, well, we had the whole thing masked off anyway. We've got all new panels and by the time that we've, you know, blended it, we may as well just paint the whole thing because... Well, there's nothing really left. So we have almost painted the full car now. All we've got to hope is that it matches the one panel which we haven't, which is that tiny little boot. But it did look like a good match initially, so I have very few concerns about that, and it's not going to be a problem. But we are getting so close to driving this car now, and it, it is not going to be long until I can hear that supercharged V8 screaming down the road. But we've still got a little bit more work to do before that. So the first piece of many to go back on is the inner wing. It was an ambitious goal trying to get this car back on the road in this video and trust me it did not all go to plan but you'll see that later. For now let's get these panels bolted up starting with this inner wing. We're being as careful as we can with these freshly painted panels obviously to avoid marking them. It's been so long since I took this car apart, I can hardly remember how it goes back together. So sometimes it's a case of bolting something on, then having to take it off again to put something else on, like with this wing trim, which I forgot to put on here. But let me tell you, putting all of these panels on feels amazing. So that's now all of the wing bolts going in, including the ones inside the wheel arch which hold the outer skin of the wing to the inner skin of the wing, and then we can move on to the side skirt. So once we replaced the brackets which clipped the side skirt to the body of the car, it was dead simple, just clipping it into those brackets, putting a few bolts in the wheel arches, and also some clips underneath. And then it was onto the back end. Now the passenger side is assembled and the first thing we need to do here is fix the parking sensor which the wire had just broken out of on one of them. So once this was soldered and then heat shrinked, that should now be good to go with a new parking sensor. Okay, now we've got the parking sensor sorted to be able to fit it in the rear diffuser. Now we can start looking at fitting this to the car. But there is one thing which I need, which plugs in just here. And I couldn't figure this out for ages what it was, but it turns out it's the fog lights which fit here and here. Now from memory, I believe from Jaguar, these were like £200 each, maybe even more than that. But I did manage to find these which are off, I don't know if you guys can read that, a Jaguar F-Pace SVR, and these have the exact same part number as the F-Type ones, and these cost £60 each, which is a huge saving. And it's little wins like that that make all the difference and really give you a little bit of extra affordability when rebuilding cars like this. So now we can reassemble the diffuser piece which the boys at Dream Ice have painted, so now we can bolt in the rear fog lights and reversing lights, and also we have to fit up the parking sensors, including these little plastic pieces pieces which hold them to the diffuser. And now the back end of the car is all trimmed up and now the diffuser is ready to go on the car so we simply plug in the fog and reverse lights and all of the parking sensors and clip it into the bumper. And then the second part of the distinctive SVR rear diffuser. Now, it actually worked out cheaper for me to buy this brand new. One, because it came in the correct colour, but two, because the one which was for sale was the wrong colour, but also more expensive than a brand new one in the right colour. Does that make sense? But now, with all the protective packaging removed off that, I can now look at this junction box on the front, which is where all the jump leads go to. Now, thanks to Eurojag, who came through again with a part that I couldn't find for only £80, including a pair of seat 
seatbelts as well. It was just an unquestionable bargain, so he managed to transfer everything from the old one into this one and then bolt it to the car. And whilst I was doing that, Corey was reassembling the front bumper, so refitting all of the grills, the parking sensors, and all of the things which I'd fitted to the bumper previously. Now this is really where things start to come together on this car because we haven't seen the full face on it. We haven't seen the car with a bumper and two headlights on which is going to be you know, a huge thing for me anyway. It feels like one of those things that's been holding us up and keeping us away from that final first drive that we've been aiming for since we started the build. So once Corey got the side grills in and also that fiddly centre grill we could then start looking at fitting that up to the car. But not before we have a quick look at the headlights that we've got to go on the car. So as I explained briefly in the last video, I had one headlight for the driver's side, but I didn't have one that I could use on the passenger side because the one that came with the car had all of the mounting points broken, so I've had to go and buy a brand new one. When I say brand new, it was brand new on eBay, so I don't think it had ever been fitted to a car, but it wasn't from the main dealer and it was a fraction of the price. So once I've got both of these bolted up, using the three mounting points they come with, we could then plug them in and that is finally a pair of headlights on the car. I've also got a new hose to feed the headlight washers to and now it's for the front bumper. Okay, front bumper is ready to go on. We've got the wiring loom in. We're just plugging in the washer jets and the new washer jet which is over there which we lost in the accident and just trying to figure out exactly what goes on with these foam bits. We've found that these foam bits sit in the bumper but this one sits on the crash bar. Is there anything we're missing? I don't think so, I think we're good to go. Let's got, find out. We've got bolts. We've got bolts, some. <laughs> Let's see what happens. So super carefully, we start to slide that front bumper into place, making sure that we don't mark the new headlights and also the fresh paint on that bumper. And it's a tight fit, but it does go on, so then we can start putting the fasteners in place across the top and the sides, ready for us to start looking at aligning the panels in the future. And the front bumper is on, and that looks immense. That's the first time I've seen this car with a face on it and it looks crazy. So now what we're gonna look at is the arch liners. You may remember I talked about these before. So you may remember I talked about the SVR arch liners and they were 1,500 pound for the pair and as nice as this car is, I refuse to pay that, especially when there's only a few minor differences between those and the R arch liners. So I'm gonna try and make these ones fit my car. If you can't remember, I'll just re-jog your memory a tiny bit. We had a look at what we could do to make these arch liners fit the SVR, and it turns out it's not even as much as a thought, as physically the R and the SVR are exactly the same in every way, shape and form, dimension-wise. They're the same width, everything like that. But there's just a few minute differences, one of them being this little section that we need to trim off here, so see what you think to this. This is the F-Type R arch liner now installed on the SVR and well it couldn't really look much better I don't think. We've used every single hole that the standard arch liner uses. It fits absolutely perfectly. The only bit we've had to do trimming wise is a small edge here. We've had to take off a section and also had to curve this edge here. But apart from that it takes every single hole here, here. We've got one more bolt to put in there but that will go in and well we can't grumble at all especially when this is the original svr arch liner which is battered but you can see here look at this hole it looks like it's been elongated by hand exactly like what we've done on here so i'm pretty happy with that that saved me 1500 pound for two svr arch liners which is just a silly number anyway so i'm glad about that but if you do think it's a bodge let me know when you come around to buy it off me and we can look at changing it but we have got another problem with the car which has flashed up without even even driving it we put it away last night and it was absolutely fine and today we've gone to it and we've got no power steering at all I've reset the battery by taking that off and leaving that disconnected reconnected it still no power steering which is worrying really because obviously we've replaced the steering rack because it was snapped in half earlier but it was working after we did that so I can't 
I can't make sense in my head of why it's doing it and why it's not playing ball. So I'm going to leave the battery disconnected overnight and see if that resets it. Fingers crossed it does. And again, it's just another battery issue because the car's not being driven enough. But only time will tell. The boys are going to finish off the bonnet tomorrow, get that assembled, and I'm going to be picking it up on Friday, ready for some more work to continue on it somewhere else. So the final few finishing touches, we've got the sill plates that have got to go over the side skirt, so Corey can pop those on, and then it's time for the bonnet. And the bonnet is just on in time. We've got a few finishing little touches to do. The alignment's a little bit out, and we've got a few extra bits that need putting on it, but we have no time left because the car has now got to go on the trailer and go off for tracking. Now, because the Jag now has a bumper on, it's a little bit harder to get on some trailers. So we've got Judd's Vehicle Transport here to take it from here to Raptor Customs, where we're gonna be doing some more work on the car after tracking. Links in description. So we are now onto the next step of our journey with the F-Type SVR, and there's a few things I wanted to do to the car before I take it on the road. So we are now at Raptor Customs, where we have spent about the last eight hours maybe a little bit more aligning all of the panels on the f-type and we are about there we're at a point now where we can move forward and start looking at some of the other bits on the car because i don't actually know any of the service history with this f-type we want to make sure that the diffs are serviced the engine oil serviced and while it's here there's a few extra little bits we may as well do as well so this is my master jag mechanic dud and you have got jlr experience especially in setting up panel gaps but with a lot of things really that's right so the first step of the next stage of the Jaguar F-Type project is taking the bonnet off. So the reason we have took the bonnet off is to make accessing the supercharger that little bit easier because we're going to be changing it for a slightly smaller pulley. Is that right? Tell me what we've got to do because I don't know anything about superchargers. So this is your whopping great supercharger okay generously comes on these jacks and we need to access this pulley here that's the upper supercharger pulley if we change that for one of our raptor performance pulleys that does look phenomenal it's very very precision engineered from a high grade billet of stainless steel this is actually smaller than the standard one so okay. it's almost like changing the gears on a bicycle it's making it go faster and faster it yeah, it yeah yeah spin faster yeah um, and faster means more boost, more is that right? Boost. More boost yeah. means? More power. More power means <laughs> more, more prizes. <laughs> more prizes. <laughs> we need to get the old one off first. Okay. So a special puller to pull it off. Let's show you that now, shall we? Show me your puller. Okay, the first thing I want to say on this voiceover is thank you so much to Dud for everything he did for me on this car and helped me do because without him this video wouldn't have got finished and got out when it is out now. So do him and me a favour and go and check out his YouTube channel. The link's in the description. It's Raptor Customs. He specialises in like performance jag stuff but does a whole host of things. So we've got the super special tool fitted to the pulley now. If you didn't have that, you may have to do all sorts of things like cutting it off or... I don't know, there's a few things you could do, but this is definitely the best way because you can do it on the car, is that right? That's right. Okay. It's, uh... I don't know if you can tell, I know nothing about superchargers. They're just like an alien world to me, but you're making it look easy. <laughs> well, hopefully this is going to pull it off nice and easy. Should wiggle the last little bit. Hey. There we go. Like work. Ta-da. It's the old. That's your. Pulley. If you have that pulley on your F-Type, you are B-Tech. Right, so here I have a test fit pulley. It's the same as the pulley we're about to fit, but with the middle dremeled out, so it just slots over the shaft. And that way we can see if the new one is going to fit. Now that looks okay, but as we go to rotate it, it's stiff, it's binding. The reason being is we need to take some material down on this casing. That is something that would scare me. Uh, now it's easily done. We're going to make basically the thickest part of the case in the same diameter as the thinnest part. Okay, so it's consistent all the way around. The way around. Exactly so right. why is it not the same? Is it just time and age? It's, and... it's poor casting, believe yeah. it or not. If we have one in where the shaft is bang in the middle of this casing, they usually go just straight on. Oh. But when they get a bit of poor machining from factory like this, we overcome it by taking a bit of material off. Nice. Now we had access to the supercharger pulley and we had the tool ready to get it off. We could cover off any holes which might go into the engine to make sure no filings get in there and then start taking a little bit of material off the supercharger to make sure that precision billet 
Raptor Supercharger pulley is going to be a perfect fit. As you can see, that's looking much better. So now we can start looking at fitting the new one. So what we've got to do first here is heat it up to FH. So that's effing hot. And by the time it's glowing red, we can then slot it onto the supercharger. And then we've got to cool it down rapidly to make sure it doesn't damage any of the supercharger bearings. And once it's cooled down with water, Dud then blows everything off with air as well to help it cool even more, but also just to make sure no water gets anywhere you don't want it. And then it's back on with all of the bits we took off. Just that little intake pipe and the support bar across the front and that small supercharger pulley is fitted. Now even though this will give a performance gain over the standard one, it's not going to be huge on the SVR because of the mapping. So we need to get the map tweaked in the future and maybe come back for some more mods, but we'll see about that. The next thing to do is start looking at the serviceable items. So we want to change the engine oil and also the differential oil because we don't know when this was last changed and also as well with the drive shaft having come out of the diff and no oil coming with it, when I change that front drive shaft, I want to make sure there is enough in it and it's going to be safe and not explode. So once we drain the engine and the diff oil, we could start pumping some fresh diff oil into the front and rear differential because this car is four wheel drive. Then it was time to change over the oil filter which we'd cracked off earlier. And then finally, a good amount of oil to fill this engine up and now it should be ready for a start. So we now have fluids in the Jag and we're gonna go for a startup now. We've also, like I mentioned before, got an issue with the power steering. Now we're hoping this could be down to the battery. That's the main, that's the main thing I'm hanging on because what, the power steering worked perfectly before. So we've reset the battery and we're just keeping fingers crossed that it's gonna work. Let's go. The battery's dead, mate. So while we're waiting for the battery to start, because the car just needs a good drive out to charge it, we are gonna fit up these wheel spacers that I back have sorted us out with. We've gone 20 mil for the rear and 15 mil for the front, because let's face it, the stance on this car, it just ain't it. So I just wanted to push the wheels out ever so slightly more towards the edge of the wheel arches, which is gonna give the car a more muscular and you know a beefier look, especially from behind, and just fill out those wheel arches properly. So using the wheel spaces from iBack with some fresh Raptor black wheel nuts for the Jag, it looks much better. Okay, front space is fitted. Let's go for startup attempt number two. It sounds good. Got any warning lights? There we go, power steering assistance reduced. Why? Embarrassingly, this is a clip from earlier in the video, and it turns out I'd wired it up completely wrong. So once Dud had sorted that, it was fixed. And then we were on the home straight. We could refit the bonnet and then just do a final alignment on the panel gaps for that. I can start fitting some of the trims that go on the underside of the bonnet, like the sound deadening and the rubbers. And then once we got the bonnet latched, the F-Type was almost ready for the road. So there we have it, one nearly completed, rebuilt Jaguar F-Type SVR, but there is one key thing that this car is missing. Actually, make that two things. The first thing we need is a number plate, so thank you to Leicester Auto Sales for these ones. And the last thing is the carbon fibre bonnet vents to finish off the car. So now we're gonna say bye to Dud at Raptor Customs. I'm gonna leave all his links for his YouTube channel, for his shop, all the bits that we've done in this video in the description. And now there is one thing that we have to do with this Jag. And that is go for a drive. But ever since I've owned this car, I feel like it's been changing me from a 28 year old boy racer into a more stereotypical, sophisticated Jaguar owner.
we're going to go over how much it's cost me to do that and whether I'm in the green or in the red. But in order to look at the cost of rebuilding this Jaguar, we've got to have it completely finished. So in the last video, you will have thought my Jaguar F-Type was completely done and boxed off. And while that might look the case from a distance, up close, this is so far from the truth. And there is multiple reasons why this is the case. Firstly, the wheels are mismatched. We have one black one on the front, the rest are grey and also have curb damage. So that all needs sorting out. So the first stage to getting this car completely finished is sending the wheels off for refurb at the wheel specialist in Leicester. So we have those removed from the car and loaded into the van. But the question is now, what colour do I do them? Honestly, I can't decide. I originally put this to you guys. I gave the option between silver with blue carpers and grey with red. 51% of you chose grey with red on my Instagram. It's just there, go follow me. I'm not gonna lie, I had cold feet for a bit. I was gonna use my vote to overpower that 1% and do silver with blue. And now I'm thinking about it some more, I still can't decide. So I'm going to let the guys at the wheel specialist get the wheels stripped before I make my final decision. So we'll check back later in the video to see what I've gone for. So while waiting for the wheels to come back, it seems like the prime opportunity to take advantage of the car being in the air without wheels on. And we're going to do that by painting the calipers because I'm not the biggest fan of the blue car with the red brakes. The combination just doesn't quite work for me. But on top of that, the paint on the caliper on the back has gone really dull and faded and started chipping away. So if I'm going to have to paint it anyway, I may as well change the colour. So to get these ready for paint, the first thing that I've got to do is get all the loose paint off the back ones. Now because the front caliper is in pretty good condition, all I need to do is give them a good rub down. And now that's done and they are fully clean and degreased as well. The next stage is to mask off the car, so the last thing I'd hate to do is get overspray all over this lovely fresh paint. So we've got to get this on there like that. Then to mask off the calipers, something like that. Now I'm going to mask off the back section of the disc and everything like that, just with like a carrier bag. I've just gone into detail around these areas with masking tape and now we should be ready for some primer. Now I'm going to use an aerosol etch primer for this because it helps then the paint bond to the bare metal parts and hopefully not going to have any problems with flaking in the future. So the calipers are now ready for their base coat. I'm going to put you guys out here because I don't want my camera getting covered in overspray and I'll check back in with you when it's done. So it is now the next day and the calipers are done. As you can see, I've done them in Porsche Speed Yellow and I am pretty happy with the way they've turned out. I've managed to put the Jaguar logo back into it, clear coat it in and it's looking... Well, I think a really nice contrast with the blue. Don't worry about the little bit of paint on the disc. That'll come off as soon as I drive down the road. And yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. And also now, the wheels are back from refurb. As you can see, I've gone slightly different to what I normally would. This is just like an anthracite colour, which I think works quite well with this style of wheel. I nearly went for silver, but I did stay away from it. You guys told me to go grey, so I went grey. You also told me to keep the calipers red, but we'll gloss over that. Now, the only thing with these is because they've now been refurbished, we have lost the SVR logo, which goes just here. And also, I think it's the ideal time to protect them. So I can apply the little SVR decal to the alloy, and then we can ceramic coat them to make cleaning and maintenance easier. So we've now got the SVR logo back in place and also protecting. The great thing about doing this is that ceramic coating will help lock in the vinyl which we've put on the alloy. While the car is up in the air and while the wheels are curing, I'm going to have a quick nose behind this wheel arch line because I think we're having a bit of a problem with the math sense that are wired in. So you may remember from when we were painting the car, I rewired this math plug-in and, well, it's not been working perfectly. Occasionally what I'm getting is an engine management light pop-up, the outside temperature on the car display dropped to minus 40 degrees, and also a warning for the math sensor pop-up, but it's only very occasionally, so I don't think it's a fault with the math. If it is, I do have a spare one, but I don't think it's that. I don't think it's the plug itself, I think just the wiring isn't quite 100%. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to strip back what I've done, and also go a little bit further back and inspect up there and rewire the plug using the same sort of connectors but just do it a bit better. So all I'm going to do here is cut off each connector, strip back the wire like that and then I can reconnect the wires using a new connection with a clear casing so I can see that the wire is in exactly the right place. And there is it all redone. I'm actually a little bit happier with it as well because before we used connectors which are like this, which are quite big and chunky, whereas this time we use little diddy ones like this, which I think will get a much better connection on such a small wire. So I've started the car up, the engine management light's not come on, but only time will tell because it was an intermittent fault 
And if it hasn't fixed it, then I'm gonna start scratching my head a bit. And even though those connectors are waterproof, I have retaped it anyway. So there we have the wheels are now back on in a freshly refurbished and protected state with the SVR logos and the calipers are painted in Porsche Speed Yellow. Now I know the yellow calipers is kind of copying the ceramic brake look, but it just contrasts the blue perfectly and really pops behind these nice new fresh wheels as well. Now the next thing is this number plate light, which is a little bit annoying because they don't sell just this light on its own. You've got to buy the full trim piece here. And I have got the new piece from Jaguar here. It was only 80 pounds, which I don't think is too bad all in. And it does come with the new section of loom, so I don't have to bother repairing the one on the car. So luckily, this comes off a little bit easier than it looks. All you've got to do is pop off these four caps, which then reveal four bolts, which you've got to remove, and the whole trim comes down. You can then pull the loom out of the car and disconnect the plug, and then it's straight back in with the new one. Nice, quick, easy little fix. Now, the interior. This is the one piece of the car which has been the most annoying, and it's this, this glove box. Ever since day one, it's never closed, and I can't for the life of me figure out why, but luckily, new glove boxes don't cost a fortune. So I can remove the glove box, which we've got in the car at the moment, by popping off the side trim, and then removing one of the T30s, and there's two inside the glove box at top, and then two in the footwell underneath the glove box. And then it's in with the new one and time to see if it's going to work. And here we go. Still exactly the same. If anything, more annoying this time because it squeaks when it comes down. I'm scratching my head on that one a little bit really because this one doesn't latch when it's off the car either. Neither does my old one. They both behave exactly the same. So maybe this one's a faulty one as well. I suppose that could be possible, but if anyone can help with that, please do down below, I'm desperate. Now the next thing on the car is a slight modification to the interior. And that brings us down to the guys at Vibe Belts, who are going to do something to make these seat belts look a little bit more interesting. And I'm a little bit stumped here on what to go for, because these guys can do all sorts of different colours on your seat belts to pretty much whatever you want, but nothing really goes perfectly with the interior on the SVR. But the good news is I can afford to do something a little bit more daring, because I've got two sets of seat belts for the F-Type. So that means that even if I don't like it or the next owner doesn't like it, they can be swapped out super easy. So I am really struggling to see what's gonna go best with the interior on the SVR because it's got all this blue splat everywhere. And sometimes contrast is the best option. So that's why we're gonna go for yellow. Like I said, this is completely reversible because we've got a second set of belts. But Cal, over to you, my friend. Perfect. <laughs> So Cal sets about stripping back one of the sets of seat belts that we've got to remove the black webbing from them to replace it with this gorgeous new golden yellow webbing. And before I can even blink, we have one Vibe seat belt. So there's the before, there is the after, and as you've seen from the clips, we're not actually messing around with any of the airbag parts of the seat belt, it's just replacing the web in itself, so it will definitely be perfectly safe. And now the new seat belts are all made up and ready to go in the car, so we can start fitting those up by removing some of the trims behind the seats and unbolting the original black seat belts and replacing them directly with the new yellow ones. I know these are out there, but they've definitely grown on me and I really, really like them now. They may not be to everyone's taste, but they're definitely to mine. And there we go. What do we think? I know the yellow is a bit out there and it's a bit of a contrast to all the blue on the inside, but I think it does break it up. None of the other blues perfectly match what was going on here, so sometimes a contrast is the best option. And it definitely sets off the yellow calipers, which we did earlier. So if you want to spice up your interior with some funky coloured seat belts or even get something maybe a little bit more subtle vibe belts the links and all the details are in the description but now all of that's done we can have a look at how much this car actually cost <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you back to what previously was the bonnet of impending financial doom, but is now 
the bonnet of crippling financial reality. So as I promised earlier in the video, we're going to be going over how much it's actually cost me to take my Category S Jaguar F-Type SVR from a wrecked example to a roadworthy example. But let me tell you, while this has been one of the most enjoyable projects I've ever done, financially it's been stressful. So the first cost in rebuilding this car was the actual purchase price of the car. Now this I didn't think at the time was too bad and this came in at £27,500 Great British Pounds, which I think for a 1 of 400 five-year-old car with 15,000 miles, which knew it was over £100,000, is not too bad. So then the first cost we incurred from there was a new steering rack. You may remember we had some problems trying to find the right one, but we did get there eventually in the end at a cost of £617. Expensive, but not too bad considering a new one was about three grand. And once the car was steering again, we could then start looking at the running gear. So we had to buy a wheel next because the original one had a hole in the back of it, and that came in at 364 quid. Next up is a tyre for that wheel, and that was £85. Then we had to change the whole corner of suspension because the bottom arm had been ripped out of the hub. We wanted to replace every single part of that corner of suspension to make sure there was no hidden damage there. But again, this was pricey. For a corner of suspension on an F-Type SVR with all of the arms and the shock and the spring and everything like that was £1,400. And 40 pounds. Then the first win of the build, the BDS actuators. These are what deploy when you're in a crash, which makes the bonnet go up for pedestrian safety. And normally both of these are deploy, but on this occasion only one did. So only cost us 215 quid. And then the tricky part is the cost of the panels, because originally we thought we could get loads of parts secondhand for the SVR, whereas it turned out this simply wasn't the case. There's a lot of listings online for things being for an F-Type SVR, where in fact they were just for a normal F-Type, which was no good. So in the end, we ended up having to go to Jaguar for quite a lot of body panels. And trust me, it wasn't cheap. The first bunch of parts we had to get was the bumper, the side skirt, the inner wing, and also a bunch of other little bits as well. Now I'm just going to bunch this into one total bill because it's a lot easier that way and all of this came to £4,508. Pricey. But that wasn't it. We have a second bill with Jaguar because originally we thought we could replace this bonnet because it is just an F-Type all-wheel drive bonnet but there was none available secondhand again. One that I did try to buy, then got unlisted when I tried to buy it. So we had to go brand new to Jaguar. And we also got a couple of other little bits while we were there, but nothing too mad. And this bill came in at another £1,500. If I'm being completely honest, we also had a little bit of help from someone at Jaguar making those prices a tiny bit better. And even then, it still stung. But luckily, we have had a lot more help than just that. We bumped into someone who was building an F-Type LM, a one-off race car, and finishing that as a project. And in that, he had basically two cars worth of parts, which he was happy for me to go and help myself to. So from Dan, we managed to get the wheel arch liners. We managed to get the dashboard. We managed to get the steering wheel airbag. We managed to get the dashboard airbag and a set of seat belts, which I somehow lost along with a couple of other bits as well. And not only that, one of the companies which accidentally incorrectly listed a bumper then contacted me saying, Chris, we're really sorry that happened. If there's anything we can do to help, let us know and we will. And they did. So they sent us out a headlight for the car, which saved us about a thousand pound. Also, they sent out a grill, which is about seven or eight hundred pound. And then also an SVR rear diffuser as well, which saved about three hundred pounds. So. In total, that was about a two grand saving and I could not appreciate that more. And trust me, without that, I think this project would have been in the bin. So to account for that, I'm gonna put a thing here for freebies and put it in brackets, but I won't put it to the total cost of the build. But that just goes to show, without people helping out and without companies like, such as Raptor Customs who helped us out in the last video getting the car serviced and everything, these builds really would not make sense. Then next up, the dashboard. Because we got the standard F-Type dashboard from Dan, we had to get all of the parts changed over from the SVR dashboard to the standard one to make it look like that beautiful spec which the car is. And this wasn't too bad, this came in at 360 quid. And while we're on the subject of kind of interior and airbags, the cost of the seat belts was 127. And we also had to get the passenger side headlight which came in at 900 pound. Now for another heavy hitter, the price of the paint job. And this came in at a total of 3695, which 
I don't know. I don't think that's too bad. And then I'm going to put a miscellaneous expenses category for things like recovery, locking wheel nut removal, MOT, a bit of oil here and there, and just bits and bobs like that. We'll include the wheel spaces in that as well, and we'll put it at £700. So that's everything that we'd spent up to this video. But as you've seen, I've spent more. So the first thing we did in this video, we've got the wheels refurbed, which was about 400 quid, And then the price of a glove box, which has gone in the bin, that's another 40 quid. And then we've got the number plate light trim, which was 80 quid, but it still doesn't stop there. Also, we haven't factored into the cost of this, the windscreen, which Liam broke for us and did a cracking job of it. That's a thousand pound. And there's still a few more parts to buy. We need a front under tray for the car because the one on the car is a bit damaged. We need a rear tow and eye cover. This one's nice and cheap, it's 30 quid. We also need some gas struts to the bonnet, which are only 40 pound. I've ordered another glove box, which is another 80 pound. And I think that just about covers up to where we are now. So the question is, what is the total? Well, give me five minutes, but in your time is going to be two seconds and I'm going to add all this up and we'll figure it out. And here we go, the grand total. And even though we've had a bit of help on this build, trust me, this still stings. Our total cost is £44,074. Ow. Now, originally when I set out to build this car, I set myself a target of £40,000 as a total cost for the rebuild. But we did have a couple of unexpected costs along the way and also an unavailability of parts as well, which was unexpected because obviously I did do some research before I bought the car, but unfortunately it turned out that that research I did was useless because those parts weren't available. So the question is, did I get a good deal? Well, I don't know. Realistically, I think if you were building this car and trying to make a profit on it, Probably not, because if you didn't have the help from people like I have, which I've been super fortunate to, like Dud at Raptor Customs, like Dan with that F-Type LM, I believe it was Richard Car Bumpers on eBay, realistically I'd be another 4,000 into this car, making the total about 48,000. And that is very borderline to whether it's worth it or not, because originally when I was buying this car, there was only one other car which I could base my price on, and that was a red example with over double the mileage. It had 40,000 miles where mine had 15,000 miles. And also it was a year older, making it a pre-facelift as well. And also it's red, which I don't think is nice. And this originally was up for 47.5. If I'd have done it for 48,000 pound and that one would have sold for that, then I'd have probably been just about okay and more or less breaking even, but it didn't. That car has since been dropped in price. So when I originally bought the car, it was up for 47.5, then it went down to 45,000 pound. Like I said, this car is a year older and has over double the mileage of mine, so it's gonna be worth a little bit less. And also I think it does genuinely add value rebuilding these cars with videos to evidence every step of the way exactly how the car is. But trust me when I say there's not gonna be a lot of profit in this build, which is unfortunate because I have put my heart and soul into making sure it's right and making sure that it's the best it can possibly be. But it's definitely not a complete loss because I've enjoyed every step of the way. I hope you guys have too. And hopefully with your continued support, we can continue to do cool builds like this. Because without you guys watching and without the support from our sponsors, these builds really would not be happening. But I hope you guys have enjoyed the F-Type build as much as I have doing it and sharing it with you. But for now, if you're not subscribed, please do consider doing so. The button's just down below. Make sure you like this video and I'll catch you next time. Words can't describe how proud I am of my Jaguar F-Type SVR rebuild. From where it's came to where it is now, I think this is the best project I've done to date. And I mean that in two ways. Firstly, in the quality of the car, and secondly, in the quality of the rebuild. But that's just my humble opinion. What really matters is the opinion of a professional. That's why last night I drove two hours north from Leicester to York and stayed in this Premier Inn behind me. And that's so we can get an opinion from Jaguar themselves. I'm not gonna lie, I'm a little bit nervous for this one, but I'm confident in the F-Type. But also, I'm kind of hoping they will find something for me to improve. Let's see what they got to say. So here we are. I guess it's judgment day for the Jag. We've now arrived at Jaguar York. The people that know more than anybody about these cars. And not only that, this branch is an SV specialist centre, meaning they should know the SVR like the back of their hand. As you can see, they've got a huge collection of Jaguar and Range Rover SVRs sat in the showroom, fetching a hefty price tag. 
But is my Category S insurance write of F Type SVR going to match the quality of these? Well, there is only one way to find out. So as I took into a complimentary coffee and brownie, the guys pulled the F-Type into the service center to take a proper look. I know I keep saying this, but I cannot put into words how proud I am of this car and how good it's looking next to all of the other non-crashed cars under the lights at this dealership. But now it's time to scratch deeper beneath the surface, rather than concentrating on just how this car looks, it's time to see the quality of the car and also the repair work. The Jag is now up and on the ramp and we have our Jaguar service tech Richard, love to meet you my friend, and he is going to check over the car for us to see what sort of condition it's in and if there's anything else which we need to change. Now I'm already aware of one part which needs doing and we have actually got that ready to go and that is this under tray here. I know, well, it didn't survive the crash very well. I've managed to plastic weld it back together to a degree but it's not in the best health. So we've got a new one here, which is specific for an SVR, ready to go on the car. And do you want to do that first, or should we have a look over it first? Uh, we, we'll, we'll do the tray first, I think. On the tray first, no worries. That's first job sorted then, let's get on with it. So Richard starts by lifting the car in the air on the four post, so we get better access to all of the bolts for the under tray. Once that was done, we had a collection of eight mils, T30s, and 10 mils to remove, which we both did. I'd use this part because it sort of survived the crash but definitely isn't usable long term so I kind of bodged it back together for a temporary measure until the new under tray showed up which is now here so let's have a look at that one now this one's off. And now you can see why I wanted to change this, it's not good is it? No, no, it's not good. <laughs> it is, yeah, it snapped, snapped I've, back together. yeah after that to be honest with you, there's a temporary measure just to get me by for now. This was surprisingly cheap actually, it's only £150 for an SVR specific part, I didn't think it was too bad. So we've got just one thing here to transfer over which onto that one and be good to go. So now it's on with the new under tray and this one looks much better. Not only is it fresh and clean, but it's not damaged and also has the right fixing points to be able to attach it to the arch liners as well. Once the under tray itself was bolted up, there's these three little air dam pieces which we've got to get into place and get those bolted on there too. So new under tray is now on and Richard's going to have a, a quick check around everything, see if there's anything that's untoward or not 100% and well I think we're going to make note of a few things that I might want to change further down the line by the looks of it. So like an absolute pro, Richard dives straight into the underbody inspection, inspecting every nut, bolt, arm everything underneath there to make sure that this car has been repaired properly and it doesn't take long for him to find something. As I said, what we're looking for here is things which could have been affected by the crash. We're going to have a quick check over the engine, but as this is such a low mileage car and only just out of warranty, we're not going to concentrate too hard on that area of the car. The main focus here is that the car is safe and that it's been repaired properly. So now Richard's underbody inspection is done around the front, he starts turning his attention to the back of the car and checking out all of the suspension components there too. Now I'm pretty happy with the panel gaps on this car, but I was quite interested to get Richard's opinion and see if he thought they could be made any better than where they are now. You could mess around for ages adjusting it because if you adjust the bumper, then it, it not. Did I mean because the the bonnet drops over and becomes part of the wing? Mm. You, you get a lot of um, 
Is it this bit? Is it that? Bit? Yeah, no, no, it was such a nightmare trying to get it to line up. It was. You have to really concentrate on your door line. If you, if you follow your door line, I think we got this bit. bit right. I think we got this really nice. This yeah. is the new wing. That's once you get this mm. bit, we found if you get the, this wing and this 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 bit here perfect, mm. then you can just play about with bumper. Uh, and the holes are bigger than the bolts. If you know what I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So now Richard has completed his inspection and is going off to make a report on my F-Type SVR and we can then see what the quality of the repair is actually like and if there's anything else which I need to sort out. So this is James, James, nice to meet you my friend. And you have the report which Richard has done on the F-Type SVR. So we're gonna go through that right now in this very professional looking office. Very different to what I'm used to. So tell me, what have we got? It's, it's not too bad actually. So we're doing the traffic light system, green, red, ambers. Only one thing that we flagged up as red. That's okay. the one you already know about front windscreen being cracked. So. I know, yeah. Blame Liam for that one. Exactly, yeah. Oh, <laughs> he he owes one. me a grand. Yeah, <laughs> going back for that. Five things that are yellow. So okay. amber stuff, not too bad, but things would flag up. Yeah. Um, starting off with the bolts for the under tray that you fit today. Mm -hmm. Some of them missing and things. Um, just something to cover up. Yeah, yeah, so definitely. We'll get those sorted in the future. Uh, front brake pads, around five millimeters left on those, and there's some impact damage on the surface face of the outer of the disc. Yes, we've just noticed that. Yeah. So that's just like a um, very small chunk out of the disc face. Yeah. 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 Offside front low suspension arms, the plastic trim on that, that's slightly damaged. Mm -hmm. um, with the rear brakes as well, they're at five millimeters, but the discs are okay on those. Okay. So that was all right. And the last little bit was there was a few of the diffuser bolts missing. Okay. Other than that, You've got two other reds, but they are for the tyres. Yep, okay. Everything else was green, washers, wipers, lights, transmission, everything else was perfect on it, so Lovely. done a good job there. Rear tyres. Those rear tyres, yeah, they're, they're not, they're not best. <laughs> yes, that launch control has been exercised well. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, so, the use. Yeah, so uh, the main things now, the windscreen, which we've got, sorted. we've got that booked in to be, in sort, to yeah. be sorted. Rear tyres, which I've got some on the way, and what was the other red? There's there was no other reds, okay. just the young ambers for the distant pads. Okay, yeah, so I'll get some bolts from the distant pads and some spare bolts. But all in, all I'd done. say that's pretty good. But a dealership saying that I've not done too bad and I'm missing some bolts and a few tiny little bits, I'm pretty happy. I'd say that's a pretty decent score. I'd be happy is, with that one. So is there anything else on here that we need to go through? No, or? that's no. it. You've got okay. all your green ticks on there as well. Other than so right now. We've got two reds, which we've got booked in. We've got five ambers, which we can sort pretty easy. Pretty simple. I'm and pretty happy with that. Green, yeah, happy days. Well, appreciate no that. Thank you very much. Now, before we leave the dealership, there is someone I need you guys to meet. Oh. I'm going to shake your hand because without you, we right. wouldn't have been able to make this happen as easily. Oh, so, oh. this is Shane. He's been behind the scenes on the end of my phone, basically for everything I need for parts. Without you, I don't think we'd be having the car look like this, and you've probably saved me a good few thousand pounds. So, I have got you a little treat um, in the boots which you're either more welcome to share with your colleagues or take home. So for reasons because of YouTube, I'm not gonna say what we've got here, okay. but there's a box of drinks. So that is yours. And also, it's, it's nothing fancy, but nice. some, some dairy milk for you as well, mate. Thank I really you appreciate much. your help. It's, as I say, without you, I don't think we'll be able to, to get this as far as we have, and as, to as good a standard as we have, so really appreciate it. <laughs> So all in all, I don't think that's a bad score for the F-Type. There's a few little bits which we didn't know about, which we do now know and can fix. Which is precisely the reason why I bought the car here. It wasn't to show off how good a repair I've done, it was to find those last final little details to take this car from being good to being great or as near to perfect as I can possibly get it. As we already mentioned, we've got the front windshield cracked, which is getting progressively worse, which we have booked in for next Tuesday to be sorted. Richard did manage to find a little bit of impact damage just here on the disc, which I completely 
completely missed, which should probably be sorted. The rear tires also has shown a little bit of wear and tear, not so much on tread depth. But if I'm honest, that might be from me testing out the launch control a few too many times. And then the final thing was a tiny bit of damage to the plastic on one of the suspension arms, which essentially just works to redirect a bit of air. Richard the tech said this is probably from being driven on and off a curb a few times so they easily get caught because it's quite a low slung part. Oh, and for those of you curious, I did manage to fix my glove box issue in the end. It was just another faulty glove box. I think what happens with these is because they're electronically controlled, when the cars get involved in a crash and the battery is disconnected, people just want to get into them. So they just stick some in there, pry them open, and I think it damages the mechanism. But we've got a new one in and this one works perfectly. I also managed to get the new rear turn on, which obviously was a very quick job. And also the gas struts for the bonnet, so it now holds itself open. But all in all, that is a pretty minor list of things to do, especially considering this is only the fourth car I've ever repaired, and we've done it in my garage at home. But for now, I need to get a few bits ordered, and I need to say a special thank you to Jaguar Land Rover York, who have hosted me and also helped me out from start to finish with finding the parts for this build and making sure I get everything right along the way. But I hope you guys have enjoyed this video, even if it was a little bit easier, but we now have the final checklist of bits to do, so this car is officially ready for its road trip but for now make sure you do like this video hit subscribe if you're not already and I'll catch you next time